Hey, boom, boom. Welcome to another episode of the Foxing Around podcast. I'm your host, Raymond Fox. And I'm your co-host, River Thomas. Hey, man. And we got a dope episode ready for you guys, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we got Damon Bell Holscher. Uh, he's going to be coming through in a few short minutes. But uh, in the meantime, man, we got a few announcements. We got a few things that we've been working on and uh, some more information about uh, the giveaway at the end of the show. Uh, first things first, we'd like to give a huge shout out to our friends Cleanest Way, uh, Duct and Furnace Cleaning, man. If you guys go on their Facebook page, we'll link it up in the comments here. Go check them out, man. If you got any work for them in and around the Saskatchewan area, give them your business, man. They're good people that you want to work with that believe in other Indigenous people. And we're just so excited that they're uh, they're partnered with us to be able to do a giveaway. So towards the end of the show, we're going to put up a phone number on our screen here uh whoever calls in first we're going to give away two hundred dollars to their choice of nonprofit or charity what else we got going on bro uh no on with the uh, cleanest story i mean who doesn't like clean air in their household man it's 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 really that simple it's about the air quality and uh i noticed there's a lot of um first nations housing that are uh, have um mold and do and like the quality isn't that good and that's what uh cleanest way comes to do they want to put an end to that and they want to have um clean air for everybody in their households other than that um you have any other uh bro merch if anyone ordered t-shirts and they haven't arrived yet give them about like a few more days and then try to get back to us man we sent all our stuff out like right at the prime of christmas and all of our stuff got delayed like crazy. So if your shirt hasn't arrived yet, first things first, we want to say sorry that it hasn't been there yet. Thanks for the support. And hopefully you'll get them soon. And uh, Keep in contact with us anyways. I think we'll be doing a little bit more merch in the next little bit. But y'all got to give us a few minutes to uh, to uh, be able to kind of do that part. But I don't think that – I think that's pretty much it, bro. Cleanest way is what I wanted to shout out. $200 at the end of the episode. Oh, yeah, enter our giveaway for the for the Wells crew uh, for their for their shoes, uh, custom pair of shoes. Uh, whoever wins it, it's going to be your size and your print. Uh, you guys can uh, pick it and uh, let them know, man. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, that's about it, man. I mean, I just got back from skating uh, down in Gap Lake. It's in the mountains, bro. It's so beautiful. So beautiful. So, but uh, other than that, I think we can introduce our guest. Yeah. You want to do that, brother? Yeah, bro. I'll give him a quick introduction, man. Obviously, I feel like he needs no introduction, man. Damon Bell Holscher, he's a former professional basketball player. Uh, he's gotten all the way to the to the pinnacle of what you can reach as an uh, as a basketball player making the NBA. And it wasn't just like a summer league thing. Like he was on an NBA roster. I, I'm pretty sure that he played in Madison Square Garden. He he was on the on the Celtics team for a little bit. So to be able to do that, I know he comes from a village of like 300 people. Like so, he's he's a a small town kid and you know he was telling us it, it's easier for me to make the lottery than than to do what i did man so but he's so much more than just a basketball player man he's got he he's got a lot of stuff that he has to say and he's ready to say and he's proud to say it and as a man to be able to say talk about you know things like mental health and and youth suicide and advocacy and and the things that he's doing it's really special to even know somebody like this so but I'm going to let him uh, – we'll jump him in here right now, man. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here is Damon Bell Holscher. What's up, bro? Uh, it's a night lot. Uh, <laughs> it's a night lot. All in the long is hot. D, good night. Log him. Stiggy, Chenu, Ejen. Tess, Janassi, Nanu, Ejen. Tau, Kunstiao, Ejen. Sao, Da, Get, Ejen, Nau, Ejen. Ning, Hosh, Long, Stung, Senior, D, Kiong. Tess, Long, Nas, Iskia, Kaj, A, D. Gusri Gualgam, Hadas Iskian, Shingda, Uijung, Hik the Hundlai, Iskian, Kik Pong, Aonash, Ijung, How Aganesh Chish. My name is Dean Bell Holter, like you had said, and uh, my Haida name is Ninghash uh, Long uh, Stungs, which means big enough to hold two souls. And I was given that name through a potlatch uh, back when I, I think I believe I was 12 or so. Uh, and in order for me to earn that name, I had to, you know, provide for my community, provide for my family and uh, make sure I was upholding that name and living out the namesake. So I'm uh, my clans are Tzeslanos, which is double-headed eagle. 
And my Slingit side is uh, Kaj Adi, which is uh, fresh mart water, uh, fresh water uh, sockeye. So, yeah, I'm happy to be here. I appreciate you guys having me. I'm excited to chop it up. Hey, that's dope. That's dope, brother. What you been up to? Like, like COVID has hit everybody in different ways or different, different, uh, you know, just just in the way they live their lives and what they've been up to. Some people like us, we've been lucky to be able to start a podcast like this. But everyone's been finding something or finding out a little bit more about your, themselves. What have you up, been up to since kind of COVID hit? And you know, kind of give us a little update. Yeah, I um, I mean, when COVID happened, it's interesting. It's been a really interesting time, and obviously, it's been an interesting time for everybody. Uh, but I. Back in April, uh, I was working. So, you know, I'll kind of go back a little bit further. A couple of years ago, I was in Vancouver about to go to Greece. I was about to sign to go to Greece. Uh, this is 2017 at the time in August. And I was um, this close to signing to go to Greece. And I called my agent and I said I was done with the guy. I didn't, I didn't want to play anymore. I wasn't happy. Um, I kind of hit my wall uh, mentally and I knew it was, it was time to hang him up in a sense. So fast forward, I went home. I, I got hired by one of our last day of corporations called Sea Alaska Corporation. I was hired as the director of Youth and Development. So my role is visiting 16 communities throughout Southeast Alaska, along with uh, a lot of our Klingit and Haida shareholders down in Seattle. So I was serving essentially over 10,000 um, shareholders and uh, I was really busy for two years and I was enjoying the process, enjoying the job. And uh, it got, it, I kind of burnt myself out in a sense. And because I didn't, I didn't give my time, I didn't give myself enough time, I think, once I was done, like truly done with basketball, I didn't give myself enough time just to like breathe. And I went full board, my, everything. And then I got hired by this corporation and I was just nonstop traveling for two years. And then when COVID happened, I was let go from my job because they created the position for me. So, they eliminated, eliminated my position, and uh, it was like, I mean, I, I'm not going to lie, it was a high relief in a sense because I wasn't happy for, like, probably the last four or five months that I was there. Uh, there was some, you know, some very difficult um, working environments and everything and relationships that, uh, that that didn't work out well. So, you know, I was let go, and I went on a couple-week road trip um, and, you know, stayed away from towns and everything. I was kind of like, you know going to just camping and everything and hanging out quote unquote trying to find myself in a sense and <laughs> I, I uh did my two-week road trip i picked up a bike and then I, hey guy like i reached out to some guys i was like, let's go on a bike ride let's go down the oregon coast and we ended up we were, we were the plan was uh, originally was to do uh vancouver down to san diego but when the fires happened we had to divert and we went from so we started in seattle we made our way to tillamook around over 500 miles then we went from Wyoming. We started on the Wind River, Wind River Reservation. We started over in Wyoming and made our way all the way down to Albuquerque, which was around 890 miles. So we did around probably around 1,400 mile bike ride trip uh, back in September. But that was kind of like prompted by uh, everything going on in a sense because my thing has always been, you know, at, you know, if if you see a problem, if you if you're gonna sit and complain about something, then go out and do something about it. You know, what I mean, if you see a gap, if you know, and that's what like our people did for a thousand years, we didn't sit around and complain and point fingers, you know, and that's what I learned how to do through my journey was like, I don't, I don't sit back and, and talk about problems or complain. I'm going to go do something and try and be, be the change I want to see in a sense. So I went on this big bike ride and, you know, it's, it's called, if you if folks want to look it up on Instagram, break the bike. Uh, we did a 1400 mile bike ride what we wanted to do was we wanted to raise awareness for uh, black and indigenous mental health because i've been you know i've worked with over 100 nations throughout you know, Turtle island and everything i've been you know, i've been traveling for 10 years all over the place and i i kept seeing a reoccurring theme of a lot of very prominent male athletes and, and young men who could have been really special at a specific thing and they kind of fell through the cracks and you know we we could as like just right now you could probably name five people off the top of your head from your guys's area your reserve that should have been, you know, went to college for something or should have, you know, should have made it. Like, I have survival's remorse in a sense because, like, there's guys coming up. I, I wasn't even, I, I didn't really, like, take off until, like, freshman year of high school. 
And prior to that, like all of my peers were better than me at basketball. We had amazing artists. Like we, we came up learning how to art. We came up speaking, we came up dancing. There was no question around it. We had like a big giant group of boys who were just proud and we were hunters, fishers, fishermen. We did all those things, you know, we were village, like I'm a village boy first and foremost. That's what, <laughs> that's what I, I, a lot of people don't really understand. Like if you came to where I came from, you'd understand like I'm, I'm, I'm straight out the village. And, <laughs> And once, once I, once I kind of saw like, okay, like there's, there's, there's a large, large gap in what's going on right now. So what I want to do is I'm going to spread awareness. Obviously I'm having these conversations because no one else is having conversations about men's mental health. So that's what I kind of wanted to do was this kind of prompt that conversation. And, and that's what happened, you know? So that's what I've been up to is kind of just, I, yeah, just kind of following, following my heart uh, since COVID happened and, working on my mental health and I know, you know, like one of my sisters said, you know, I have to take care of myself because a lot of our people need me in a sense, just like they need all of us. So I just realized how important it is, you know, to continue to keep, to keep, you know, growing mentally. And, you know, that's what that, that whole entire experience was, was we just wanted to have conversations. Hey, for sure. For sure, bro. I want to dive into all that a little bit more and kind of understand a little bit more. I know you're like the mental health thing is very important to me and River too, because I don't feel like it gets talked about. But the first thing first, I want you to take us back and tell us a little bit about the village, bro. What was it like growing up? How did you grow up? You know, like what were your, your uh, circumstances and situations when, when you were a young man, young boy? Yeah, you know, again, uh, it's easy to look at me and, 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 you know, you said you ran, we ran to each other years back. And I'm <laughs> yeah. obviously a big human being and, and uh, a lot of people assume because of, of my confidence of how I care of myself and, you know, where I went that they, they don't really understand like where I grew up. And again, where I grew up, like you go through the community and our, our culture is very, very proud. And if you, like I've said, if you know height of people, you know, like, we get down in basketball, you know, and, <laughs> and growing up, I'm not, I'm not going to even exaggerate. Like I've played open gyms all over the place. Obviously, you know, I played professionally and everything and growing up, like we had some of the best open gyms in all of Alaska. Like I'm not, ex I'm not joking. You know, I could legitimately count 10 guys from a town of 300 people who should have played some type of college basketball. You know what I mean? And that's, and that's and that's what I realized. And I was watching all of these guys. Like uh, one guy, you know, one guy six three, six three and a half, one one step windmills, forty four inch vertical, you know. And this other guy was very very good. I, and I legitimately to this day, you know, I legitimately he's about a six one guard. I would come home when I was playing AAU every summer. I'd come home and play him one on one every day. And I'm and I'm 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 on the verge of like playing against Division one players. Like I'm seeing what college like a, what a college recruit looks like. And I'm going home and I'm playing against these guys in my town. I'm like, what, like, what, you know what I mean? Like, what's, what, what, why, why, why didn't these guys make it in a sense? And as I saw and I heard and I started to dive into their stories and learn more about their stories, I was like, oh, these guys are just messing up, blah, blah. blah. And it's one of those things, like, it, I was fortunate because my, our open gyms are very, very tough. And from the time I was a kid, I was like a little kid, like sixth, seventh grade, I started going and playing with the men. And I was, <laughs> I would get cussed out every night. I would get balls thrown off my head. I would, get, you know what I mean? If I tried to pass, I would get yelled at. Like, I, I would go home and I'd be terrified to go back to open gym. And when it's one of those things where you grow up in trauma or you grow up in um, tough environments, you're always in survival mode. And I would tell people that is that, you know, I was fortunate that I had my dream. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made it. And I was fortunate that I had my culture. Otherwise, I wouldn't have made it. So, I would i didn't want to go to open gym like i would like literally not want to go because i just i was terrified you know what i mean like i was terrified i would get cussed out i think i was gonna get beat up um i'd go to school and being the only mixed black kid in the school it was difficult for me there and then at home it was very like i had a very traumatic um upbringing as well you know a lot of domestic violence a lot of those difficult things and circumstances but as time goes went on the more and more i learned about why I was treated certain ways or why my parents did these things. And that's why I talk about mental health is because I had to learn about trauma. I had to learn about intergenerational trauma, I had to learn about residential school. All of my great uncles went to residential school. You know, I had to learn about my, both of my parents' trauma. The best thing that I ever did is I sat down and I listened to both their stories, you know, and from that day moving forward, I was like, I can't be mad at you guys. You, you did, I'll, I'll never forgive you for certain actions but i've forgiven your souls you know what i mean i've forgiven your hearts because you did the best you would, would like once i sat there and listened i was like damn like, like 
I am, I'm, you know, and I'm, and there's both survivors of a lot of different violence and whatnot, you know, and once I heard those things, I, I wasn't upset. So in a nutshell, you know, the environment shaped me and, and, and now if you, if you grew up in Heidelberg, you have to be quote unquote tough in a sense, you know, like we're, we're tough people, you know, we grew up in the water. I grew up hunting. I grew up fishing. I grew up, you know, I grew up in the river every day and then, you know, basketball, like became my kind of became my, my dream obviously when i was in seventh grade um it's funny because in seventh grade i went down to seattle i was really fortunate uh, my mom and dad could afford for us to go on a vacation to seattle during christmas break i saw family and everything and we went down there and we went to the seattle supersonics game it was in seventh grade and i'm to put things in perspective i'm 510 ish 59 ish about 230 pounds like, I'm, I'm a big boy, you know what I mean? And, like, I'm not athletic. I have no athleticism. You know, I'm out of shape. I'm insecure. I have no confidence. And I'm not, like, it's not a joke, you know? Um, I was in a very, I was in so many dark places. In seventh grade, we go down to Seattle, and my dad, he brought me to um, the Sonics games. I got to watch 76ers and the Raptors. So I got to watch Allen Iverson in person, and I got to see Vince Carter in person. And my dad said my eyes just kind of lit up watching um, those guys out there that day. And we go back after that after Christmas break, and we had to like, and we had to do a um, a project where you say like, oh, this is what I want to be, right? And we always ask. Sometimes we ask kids that, but the surprising thing is like, I've traveled all over the place, and I'll ask kids like, what do you want to be? Uh, and it's uh, and that's why I teach manifestation. It's like if you want something, like you have to put actively put it out there in the universe. So when I'm in seventh grade, I come back from this pro. I come back and I have to do this project on what do you want to be when you grow up. Raise my hand again. No confidence. I'm chubby. I'm out of shape. I'm you know what I mean. And I raise my hand. I'm like I'm gonna be on TV someday. Like I'm gonna go to college. I'm gonna play college basketball. And I'm on a classroom of twelve kids. My classroom of twelve kids erupted with laughter. And I remember in Mike Andreessen, he was my teacher in middle school. Mike Andreessen, he had played college basketball. So he kind of understood like what my potential could maybe be if I committed myself. So he comes up to me after class. I'm just like sad because like everyone laughed at my dream. And I, again, the more I learned about, learned about trauma and the lateral oppression and how, you know, when folks are um, interested, they're, when they're afraid to like pursue their own dreams, they're going to knock other people's try to tear other people's dreams down but that's what we know that's what we were taught through through oppression and through you know the divide and conquer tactics so i said that mike andreessen comes up to me and he's like hey like he and this is what he said he says don't worry about it you're gonna be dunking on those guys someday <laughs> and 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 people don't understand like how much that helped like it, it's funny you know that's literally all he said but it was just like in my it was like don't it was in the sense like don't trip like don't worry about what other people have to say pursue your goals, pursue that dreams. And I'm not exaggerating from that day moving forward. I would tell anybody and anyone who would listen that I'm going to be on TV someday. Like it wasn't, there was no question about it. You could ask all of my friends I grew up with. Like it, it probably got annoying. Like I was constantly saying, like, I'm going to play college basketball. I'm going to play college basketball. You guys will see me on TV someday. And I started to climb in a sense. And, and I, again, I, I devote all that back to, you know, growing, growing up in Heidelberg and, if I don't, if I'm not, if I don't have a thorough, thorough understanding of who I am as a Haida man, you know, and that's where I grew up. I'm Haida, I'm Shinge, and I'm off, um, I'm black as well. And I grew up immersed in the Haida culture. My mom apprenticed our last 10 fluent speakers. We only have four that are alive right now. They're all over 90 years old. My mother apprenticed our last 10 fluent speakers. She was the leader of the dance group for 25 years. I would sit there and listen to her speak Haida with the elders. You know, I grew up like with aunties coming down, weaving, um, beating, and I just, I grew up immersed in the Haida culture. And that's what I always say is like, if I don't have that connection, I'm not successful out there. You know, I don't make it. Like my my proudest moment ever was when the Boston Globe did a write up on me and they said, Dan Bell Holter of the Haida Tlinga tribe. And then the analytics people said that um, Haida, the Haida, Haida people were Googled 10,000 times after that. You know what I mean? So like that's 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 like my one of my proudest moments, you know, and because of what basketball can do, what sports can do. So that's why I say is you know is that is that the community the community was good for me and um, and you know created you know created me in a sense and built me up, but also it was a lot of very difficult circumstances that and that's why I work so hard on what I do. Yeah, no doubt. Like uh, so, when you're getting to the point of so obviously. 
you know, to get where you're at, you transition out of your body shape and, and, you know, you like kind of put work ethic into it. You also grow, you know, where are you at between like the high school to college, you know, like how does that transition go? You know, like I know being from Alaska, like you're probably not going to look as much as somebody from North Carolina or from New York or, you know, so to, to have that dream, but also be so far away in a sense from that dream, how is that to navigate? And then, you know, like going forward, like, how did you even get to D1 from being, you know, in a small place in Alaska? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, I was for, again, it, it's the creator. I mean, ancestors are very, very strong. Like I said, from a statistical standpoint, I think it's uh, it's 3.1% uh, of high school athletes in the United States go to college uh, basketball and zero points, like 0 0.003 go to professional ranks. You know what I mean? So um, I went to, I, I left and when we talk about mentors, when we talk about mentors and how important they are, I saw somebody um, said something about mentors. The mentor that changed my life, one, Mike Andreessen was very, very helpful because he planted a seed. You know what I mean? Um, and we don't understand how important those seeds are because of what they could potentially grow to. So uh, that happened in seventh grade. I went from 5'10", about 6'2", that year. I grew about four inches, but I, I went from 220 to about 180. <laughs> so I, I, I completely, yeah, it was a complete, like, that summer, I was just, that summer and that next year, I was just so locked in. You know, I was just like, I, I you know, I was wrestling my eighth grade year, and I just wanted to find ways to get in, like, good shape because I knew I had to get in a lot better shape. Um, so I, I go down to Seattle, my freshman year of high school during Christmas break again, and I go down there and I hadn't seen my uncle, a huge hoop fan, big basketball fan. Um, and I hadn't seen him since I was a little kid and <laughs> he sees me like, Oh, what the heck? Like this guy got, like, I was like my freshman year, I'm six, four, you know? And he's like, what the heck happened here? And we go down and we go down to this park and we're shooting around and stuff. And we're kind of, he puts me through like a workout. I had never experienced like a workout, a skills workout. You know what I mean? I had no idea what this was in a sense. And he like puts me through some things. He's like, Oh, interesting. Uh, you, you know, you, you, you're looking pretty solid. So by the end of my freshman year, I'm about six, five. And I go down to Seattle and I make, I play, I play for a team, um, this random team from Mont Lake Terrace, smaller AAU team. We went to like three or four tournaments. And AAU is Amateur Athletic Union. I'm not sure. It's like you guys have kind of clubs over there in Canada. Yeah. So Amateur Athletic yeah. Union is very, very big, big business in a sense because like, and I, we'll get more into that because it's a, it's a very ugly business. But essentially, um, these teams are sponsored. Uh, and some of them are sponsored by big from Nike, Adidas. There's three big tournaments that happen in Vegas. There's tournaments that happen out in Orlando, all over the country. They're huge. Adidas sponsored, Nike sponsored. Um, and Reebok sponsored tournaments. Reebok used to be very big back in the day. Then I go down there, I make this team, and I play in three tournaments. And I, the, the most coaches I had seen at a game were probably four or five Division One coaches. One from like it was like Montana, Montana State. Those guys. It was like random little tournaments in Oregon that we went to, and they were they're solid. They were good. There was good players there, but it was nowhere near what I was going to tap into the next year. So going into my that's going into my sophomore year, I make that team. I do well. Um, my coaches on that AU team, they come up to me, they're like, Hey, these guys want to recruit you. I'm like, I don't know what that means. <laughs> I was like, I don't, I don't know what this, I don't know, like, what that means. Like, they want me to come to college. Like, I don't, like, I don't know what the heck that even means, you know? And so as time, yeah, as time went on, I was like, I, I, I was, I was always talking about it and speaking about it, but I had no idea what it looked like. I didn't have mentors. There was no one, there was no other indigenous people who went on and played college basketball or played professionally. And there was no one who I could look to and be like, hey, like, what's going to happen next? You know what I mean? Like, what's the next step? So I had my uncle, but again, like, I don't have anybody who had really experienced it. And that's why it's so important that we find our mentors, because we have to be able to find people who have experienced things and who could help us, like, kind of navigate through those. So I make that team, and I do well that summer. The next summer, that's when things get real. <laughs> so I get, like, I, that year I had, like, three letters from Eastern Washington, um, couple of random schools you know what i mean like really like small division one schools again i don't know like the difference between d1 d2 at the time really um but the next summer i uh, my uncle gets me a trial with friends of hoop so friends of hoop is one of the what was at the time one of the biggest um teams in the country we that team i had um spencer haas john brockman isaiah thomas who's a little lefty in the nba micah downs went to kansas martel webster went to the nba 
So I walk in the gym about six, 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 seven at the time. And Micah Downs and Marshall Webster are six, eight small forwards. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, okay, like this is like these guys shoot threes. These guys could do whatever they want with the ball. Everyone's dunking all the damn time. Like, I don't see this. You know what I mean, like, it's it like it's how you see in these these tournaments, these elite level tournaments, because the viral videos have gone off. Like, I was playing Demar Rosen and all those guys back in the day. You know what I mean? Like, all those guys that we see on TV. Like, I was with all those guys from the time I was a sophomore, all through the ranks. You know what I mean? So. I uh, I make that team, and I'm all, I'm super overwhelmed in a sense. I'm like calm. I'm like I, I I'm sh- I'm kind of sh- not lo- not shocked, but like holy cow, this is overwhelming because it was going so fast. I make the team. The next week it was a Houston Hoop Classic out in um, Houston, and we walk into the gym. It's the first game. We walk into the gym. I look over to my right. There's Coach K, Roy Williams, Jim Calhoun, Tom Izzo. There was 150 divisional coaches in this gym, <laughs> and. <laughs> Look down the other side of the court. There's Gary Johnson's going to Texas next year. There's Tommy Mason Griffin. He's going to Oklahoma next year. This guy's going to Maryland. I'm like, okay, like, it, I'm telling you, it went so fast that it was just, it became like a, a normal thing in a sense, even though that's not normal for a village boy to experience. And we're out there, we're out there in that in that tournament, and and uh, it was just, yeah, it was immediately like once the like once the progression started to happen, I was like okay let's 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 let this is happening it's happening and after that after that summer going into my junior year it was a wrap for alaska <laughs> like, but you know I, I went like i i took a crazy crazy jump from my sophomore to junior year i went from border you know i was first team all state as a sophomore in alaska you know what i mean i was all tournament all these tournaments i played but sophomore to junior year it was like such a crazy jump because i went from like I was dunking here and there and stuff like that to like my junior year. I'm dunking on everybody. I'm average, average 30 and 19, um, <laughs> as a, as a junior. And, you know, I was, I was runner up player of the year. The only reason I didn't get player of the year is because we didn't go to state. And, you know, I mean, like I was like, it was, it was easy in a sense, but what it did was it created a lot of lazy habits because when you're the biggest and you're more athletic than everybody and you're, you have a higher IQ than people, you know what I mean? So as time on, like things just got, it was like super easy that my junior year, and then uh, my junior year, I go out. I go out on the scene again. I do my thing. Um, going into my senior year, I had about twenty Division One offers. Uh, I had, you know, everybody was recruiting me. But through that time frame, I didn't know what the NCAA clearinghouse was. So the NCAA clearinghouse, they 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 make sure that you have a certain amount of core credits. Then from my junior to senior year, they bumped up the core credits. That's English, math, science, all of those from twelve to sixteen, right? So you're required, you have to have 16 core credits and your GPA has to align with whatever your ACT score is or your SAT score is. I didn't know about these things. So going into my senior senior year, I'm supposed to be registered for the clearinghouse two years prior. Going into my senior year, because my school had never had a division one athlete, you know, like I was the third, I'm the third division one athlete to ever like come out of Southeast Alaska. So, <laughs> so when I was experiencing this, like, I, again, I had no one to guide me. So I get to there and all these coaches are like, hey, are you registered register with the clearinghouse? Are you registered with the clearinghouse? So folks backed off because they're going to go after somebody whose grades are already ready, right? And they know that it's not going to be an issue. So um, going into my senior year, I took multiple visits. I went on a recruiting trip to Old Dominion, um, Missouri State. I went on my unofficials to Gonzaga. I, on my unoffic- you know, I was on a uh, visit with like Ab- Avery Bradley, who's in the NBA. He was on my visit. Abdul Ghadi, who is the number one point guard in the country ahead of John Wall at one point. Um, back in back in the day, and those guys were on my recruiting trip. Like I played in the D League with Abdul. Actually, that's my guy. Um, but yeah, as, as time went on, it was like it, it, it happened so fast. And I always I tell people that I, like, I don't think you really understand like how much it was had I had to sacrifice. I moved from home when I was fourteen. When I said earlier, I talked about mentors. I went to uh, Mount Edgecombe High School in Sitka, Alaska. I played for a guy named Archie Young. Hall of Fame coach. He's in the Alaska Basketball Hall of Fame. He's one of the greatest, you know, one of the most respected coaches in the state of Alaska. And he, um, he, he, he literally, like, he, he, in a sense, broke me. You know what I mean? Like, he, he, he pushed me so hard because I was like, oh, I'm going to play Division One ball. And he's like, well, your work ethic's not aligning with it. You know what I mean? And he was always on my head. Every game, I would get so upset because, like, he would get on me all every game. Damn it, Damon. Every practice. Damn it, Damon. I would call my mom literally crying, like, hey, I, I don't want to be here. Like, this, he's so dang mean to me. And, and, and as time went on, my mom was like, oh, this is what you signed up for. 
You know what I mean? And that's where a lot of our, our, our parents have a hard time sometimes. Like we won't let our kids fall on their faces. And that's where um, we have to get, but we have to let kids, we have to teach kids how to fall on their face and get back up from it. And that's what Archie did is I remember like I put my head down when I'd like be feeling sorry for myself when he would be like getting on me and coaching me up and he'd tell me, always pick your head up. You don't look down when I get on you, you know? And it was always like eye contact and he was just so, so hard on me. And like, that's my guy to this day. Like I text, we text all the time, but um, I left when I was fresh, I left when I was a freshman in high school, 14 years old, and I'm essentially gone for, for like a decade or more because uh, I'd, pl- I'd be gone throughout the year because I left my hometown. I'd go home for like a week and a half and then I'd have to go play AAU. So I'd be gone for two and a half months in the summer and I'd get back home. I'd only be home for a week, you know? So that question of like, people always ask like, why'd you stop playing? Why'd you stop playing? I was like, I did it. You know, I, I, I gave up literally, literally half of my life to pursue what I wanted to do. You know what I mean? Then that's was the thing is that it, it was like, you said it is like, it's a long journey. And I just, I, I, yeah, in a sense, like I, I, I was able to, I was able to kind of see everything work out for myself, which, which was, which was crazy. <laughs> Yeah, no doubt. I want to like touch a little bit more on it because there's two things that I think are like important when talking about your career. And that the first one is uh, your junior year at Oral Roberts, man, because I know that you like you were like going to be the man, you know what I mean? Like they had you like pegged to be like the, the, the man of the conference, you know what I mean? And uh, just, you can even see it. If you look at the comparisons between your sophomore year and your, your senior year, it's like mm-hmm. there, there's a big, but as, as a D one player, you're supposed to always progress, especially if you're a four year player, right? Every year you're supposed to get better and do more and stuff like that. So I know you had some personal issues at that time during your junior year. Uh, I want to know like, like what was that? Was it like expectation? was it like the weight of it all or was there just shit going on at home like what what kind of caused that um i look at because i look at my career and i could and anyone could say oh i regret this you get that. one of my not a regret but like things like i wish i could have done a little did a little bit differently so i had two herniated discs in my back my junior year like i was literally like i should have redshirted it it's that's how bad it was i would literally play a game and i couldn't walk for two or three days you know what i mean yeah. like I, my body was jacked up for the whole entire year and because like we didn't have our strength coach because of the the um, strength conditioning scene changed drastically from throwing around a bunch of big weights to everything's all band work and mobility and real performance right so my junior year like it was um, it was the hardest years of my life because you said like i was like first i was at every first like i was on all the college be- um, college basketball magazines i was pegged to be i was like you know i was both being voted as a, a potential player of the year in my conference and I hurt like I had a good off season. I'm in shape and everything. Yeah, and then I hurt, I hurt my back um, right before the season started, and it was just it was bad all year. And I look back at it and I like I wish I could have redshirted that year because my senior year was really really good. So I went from you know my junior year, I think I averaged like eight and five or something, and I, I my minutes were like this, you know. And it was just and that's the thing with sports is like it will, it could break you, you know, it could break you mentally. And I could have I could have said okay, like frick, it's not going to work out for me now because that was in my mind is like man, my back's messed up. I'm not having a good year. Like now, there's a lot of a lot of pressure on me as a senior because I want to play professional basketball. I want to play for a living, you know. So junior to senior year, we got a new strength coach. And everything with him was all mobility, all movement. I lot I dropped down to like I was at like five point four percent body fat, super lean. I was you know I was athletic and everything. And then yeah, as you could tell, like my senior year, I was a monster. Um, I averaged twenty one and in eleven in our conference. I um, every if you go look up our stats, like when we play the Memphises, when we play all the big schools, like I always did my thing. You know what I mean? My senior year, my sophomore year, like every time I knew that I was gonna be going up against guys that could have, have NBA players potentially. I, it was, I was always like, okay, it's, it's time to turn up. And you look it up, I, I always had double doubles, you know. Um, so I just, I always made sure, like, when I, when I hit my freshman year of college, uh, this is, always sticks out to me. I always tell people about this. My freshman year of college, my, one of my best teammates, my favorite teammate of all time, Mike Crayon. That's my guy from Kansas City, junkyard dog, man. Like, the, one of the hard, like, he could guard one through five positions. I mean, six, six, athletic, strong doesn't complain like he just plays so 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 hard so that's my dog so freshman year of college we're at freaking we're at uh wake forest first game of the season Eighteen thousand people in there packed out gym crazy crazy it's the acc you know what i mean like that's that's big time and and 
it's loud as heck. I'm like, holy cow, like I've never seen this type of experience. My boy's like, boy, he's like hopping around. He goes, boy, he goes, hey, when the when the start when the little lights are on, that's when the stars come out. You know what I mean? I was like, oof. And that stuck with me forever. I was like, when when you know what I mean? When all when the magnifying glasses are on, when the lights are on, that's when you gotta like show out. So my senior year I had a big senior year because I, I there was a lot of pressure on me my senior year because I wanted to play for a living. I knew I had to have a big year in order for that to happen. So yeah, like yeah, my junior year it was, it was a very 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 tough dance for me. Yeah. Uh, where did the injury come from with the herniated discs? Like, how long did you have that? And I think it was, what, I, what caused it? Yeah, I think it was um, squats and everything. Like, I haven't I haven't done a squat since like that since then since my mm -hmm. my junior year and. Um, like I said, everything, like the whole entire strength conditioning performance world has changed like crazy. You know what I mean? Like you don't see a lot of guys doing squats. You don't see a lot of guys doing big weights. Everything's band work. You look at Steph Curry and you look at those guys, like look at their bodies. They're, like, they're not big, strong, imposing bodies, but they're very, very strong from an athletic standpoint. You know what I mean? James Harden, like James Harden's a freaking bully, but you know what I mean? Like you, you look at these guys' bodies and like that big, you know what I mean? In comparison to the nineties and everything where guys yeah. were all jacked and stuff, like nobody looks like that anymore because the whole, like everything has changed. So uh, my junior year, yeah, at the beginning of the year, I was squatting. I think I was hand cleaning or something like that where like it was some type of motion and then my back, it just eventually got worse and worse throughout. It was literally the whole entire year. And then that, yeah, that summer. And I like, I would literally like, I would play a game and I had, I'm telling you, like, I would be, like, in so much pain, and they would have to put cortisone shots and our epidural on my back, like, big old needles like this, and they'd put those in my back, like, every couple of weeks. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it, in that, like, the, like, the mental tool that has on you when you're, when you have, when you're being injected to numb pain, and, and you're being guilt-tripped by teammates, and you're not, not guilt-tripped, but you're expected to be there for your team in a sense, you know what I mean? And yeah. at the same time, like, I understood about um, having my best interest because again, I should have looked into red shooting that year because I was hurt all year. You know, it was, it was a rough year for me and it was like, it was emotionally, physically, it was so, so draining, but I didn't have that option, I guess, of like red shooting because I never thought about it. I didn't, have, my coaches didn't put that on the table, even though they knew like how much I was going through, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So like essentially it was Olympic lifts, right? And I'm guessing you never really, squatted heavy or did did any heavy lifts before your strength and conditioning coach put all this on you that's essentially what it was what's that oh so i'm i'm saying like so it was obviously olympic lifts that caused the injury and i'm just guessing that like you probably never had any prior weightlifting experience in the gym before that injury happened right they probably just threw you to the wolves and you just like ended up hurting yourself is that kind of what happened because you it's um even like today in colleges you kind of see that now like there definitely is benefits to heavy weightlifting, but you have to know what to do and it has to be in moderation you have to be able to um have um splits in your workouts right like uh for uh, a six to eight week period you'll lift heavy get your strength up and then while you're doing that you also want to focus on your plyometrics get your fast twitch fibers going you want to focus on doing your sprints and everything just to to, to be an athlete first but then mm -hmm. a weightlifter second that's something that i always learned uh growing up and just like playing sports just like you because i play volleyball right and it's that that's all it is is jumping 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 and a lot of my teammates do get um sore backs and whatnot and that's kind of just to like not really lifting weight properly that's not having the strong core to constantly go up and down and there's a lot a lot of back pain there so that that's what i was wondering like with you is it just like you just kind of got thrown in like the wolves there and just like hey do these do these do these because olympic lifts are hard man they're so hard yeah i think that, that was it too is this it was it was in it wasn't in moderation you know and again mm -hmm. that first coach our first train coach was again it was like we're gonna throw a bunch of weight you know what i mean like it was all throwing a bunch of weights where the next guy who comes in first 15 20 minutes we're all we're doing nothing but stretching with bands we're doing like stuff to get our hips loosened up we're getting our ankles work you know what i mean like all around like your whole entire body mm -hmm. so that was maker for me but yeah prior to that is like i had a I had, we had a coach and even in high school I, I lifted and everything and like because that, that's a big part of it too of why i got so athletic uh going into my my junior and senior years like that uh my junior year 
I, um, this is stupid. <laughs> I, I was in a PE class and a weightlifting class. You know what I mean? So like, I was just like constantly working on, you know what I mean? I was constantly doing plyos and like, and I got super bouncy my junior year. Um, mm -hmm. and I got really athletic my junior year and that went into my senior year. And then, you know, when, once I got to college, I, uh, I started lifting differently and everything. I kind of like got a little bit more bulkier, bulkier. And then I leaned out my sophomore year and then junior year, my back was messed up. And then senior year, I was super lean. So and I think it was just kind of like, kind of, I guess, trial and error, you know, because all everyone's bodies are different. You know, everyone's yeah. body is different and we all carry things a different way. We're all able to do certain lifts a certain way um, without hurting ourselves. So I think it was just, it was kind of, yeah, it was kind of thrown to the wolves in a sense um, without a coach. But it was just, it, I, 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 I wasn't doing what was specifically needed for my body type. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? that's what happens too with sports is like we'll put everyone and have everyone doing the same yeah. exact and when we got that new coach my junior year or my senior yeah my going into my senior year he would like have daily checkups like if you're a lighter guy like a skinny guy or whatever and you're coming below weight where you should be you're gonna have to like he's gonna make you wake up at 6 a.m you have to go eat breakfast with him <laughs> and if you're above weight if you're above weight when you weigh in left where you're supposed to be you're gonna wake up at 6 a.m you can go run with him you know what i mean so like, yeah like, his accountability is what like really helped me so much is like there was weekly accountability where before like we never like checked our way. It was like, we checked our way to be here and like here and there. And like, that's very important of like watching your weight fluctuate, especially during the season. So once you yeah, have the guy, the guidance was like completely different going into my yeah. junior. Year. Uh, what, what was your max Bert? Um, Honestly, I, mean, I think I think I, when I did my combine stuff, I think I was like thirty nine off standing. Wow! Solid. But it could be like I was, I, I I was a power jumper. I could get off the ground, and I would tell you like I mean I've 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 dunked on people, and I would catch bodies here and there. But in comparison, like when you climb to those levels, like everyone's athletic. Like there's mm -hmm. guys six ten with forty inch verticals just just because <laughs> you know what I mean. Like we and it was funny too because if we if we were playing in of these big tournaments, and we'd be playing um a team from like alabama or a florida or a, like a southern place you knew everyone's gonna be bouncy as heck <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah i'm telling you, these guys you knew the warm-ups you're gonna be in warm-ups and every one of these guys are going between the legs like we're like 16 year old kids you know what i mean like and but we just knew yeah we just knew like and it's interesting like where how you you kind of know what you're going up against like if we were playing a mission we knew we knew we we're probably gonna play a bunch of white boys who could shoot you know what i mean it's like we kind of yeah. you're like know exactly like the territory you know what i mean if you're playing new york it's gonna be a bunch of tough dudes straight out of brooklyn you know what i mean like i went and played in this tournament called uh rumble in the bronx you know what i mean it's very like right in the bronx and uh you just you knew what you were kind of signing up for where you were going just like in our indigenous communities you know what i mean like you know like if you go to play this town oh man these fans are gonna be crazy you go play in this town oh these guys have this guy these guys play really well in their gym you know what i mean so yeah, yeah time went on, we kind of like were able to like i was kind of like able to see you know like different different territories and, and what type of athletes are going to be there yeah no yeah that that's that's cool especially how you talked about how everybody reacts differently like how you found out what was right for you just going back to the workout thing because like for me personally i went through a lot of trial and error i had to lift weight lift weight lift weight and um i lifted heavy and then like my vert went down and I was like, why, why is this right? And then I, it's because it wasn't, I wasn't being an athlete first. I was just weightlifting, weightlifting. It wasn't until I started focusing on plyos more that, and like I put in work, man, like I put in work just to get a vert. I ended up getting a 36 inch vert this year, like 36, 37. And, um, and then you look at like my buddy who's like, doesn't lift weights at all jumps, but he has like a 38 inch vert. And I'm like, bro like i have to work so hard for this and it's so natural for this guy you know what i mean yeah 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 no it's 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 crazy and like so um you talk that you're kind of more of a a coach now also to youth right do do you dabble in the like the sports and conditioning stuff with them too or is it just more like a skill development and like mentorship Everything it kind of it was cool this last year. Or so I mean, obviously, like, I've I've worked with thousands of young people in, in basketball, and uh, this last year when I was in Juno, I actually got an opportunity to be an assistant coach for a whole year. Because like when I was in college, like my coaches were like, "You're going to come coach. You got to come coach. You got to come coach." Because I um I never like, I never um I never missed a recruit. 
like every time I would host a recruit on their visits, I never missed a recruit. I always got recruits. So my coach was like, I, I knew I'm good with people. I knew how, I know how to positively imp- pick people up. So my coach is like, my coach still, my assistant coach still contacts me this day. Like, when are you going to come coach for me? When are you going to come be an assistant? When are you going to come sign, you know? And uh, I, I just, I, as time went on, I didn't really like, I knew that I wasn't interested in committing myself to being a coach because like you climb that ladder and everything. It's, it's like, a, it's, again, it's a full-time uh, job. You know what I mean? A lot of sacrifice. And I wasn't interested in that, but this last year um, I was asked, I was in Juneau, Alaska. I coached up at Thunder Mountain high school. It was an amazing experience because um, I, you know, humbly, like my, the coaches said, like the, the, the difference from when I got there to before that was just, uh, uh, you know what I mean? It was very, very noticeable. And it started with because a couple of the seniors, uh, the kid guys who were going to be seniors, they reached out to me prior, like preseason, because I was like, I'll, I'll help out or whatever. And then we started getting it in. The younger guys started to fall in line because they saw like how hard I pushed these guys. And and I know that for, like, I, I know how to really get a lot out of people. So when I brought me on, like the whole, like I changed the whole, like I, held, I, I, I had a hand in changing a lot of different things. So every single day we're spending time stretching. I'm bringing them for extra strength conditioning sessions at the gym, um, skill work every weekend, you know what I mean? They're meditating at the end of every practice, which they like the first day when I showed the meditation, they're like giggling and stuff and their eyes are closed. and. And it's slowly, you know, slowly that, that first time they meditated, it was like, what the heck, like, like, whatever, you know? And the next time it was so funny. We 25 minute meditation, our eyes closed, like, you know what I mean? Talking to them and everything. And they get up and they're like, whoa, <laughs> you know? Like, and you just saw, you saw the mental, like I, I was able to help build them build mentally rather than just physically, you know? And that's the biggest thing as a young athlete specifically is you have to teach them how to fail. You have to teach them how to be coached. You have to teach them how to be criticized. Um, not take things personal when someone's getting on you. And I just, I learned how to like find the the medium in a sense, you know what I mean? Of I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to push you. I'm going to get on you. Um, you might, you know, might get some very harsh words here and there, but you're also going to know, I love you. You know what I mean? And I'm very, very fortunate. And I have, I have a couple of young kids who one kid in particular who could potentially go on and, and do what I did. He's an athlete basketball boy up in Alaska right now, you know, and as a sophomore, he's arguably going to be player of the year this year. And with him, um, with him, he's also Afro-Indigenous as well, so it's really, really cool. Um, and with him, it's like I'm giving him all the game. You know what I mean? I'm giving him everything. Like he contacts me, I give him everything. And I, I, I wish I had somebody who I could regularly contact on it, like all the time that I had experienced what I was going to experience. You know what I mean? I never had that. Like I couldn't contact Carlos Boozer. And, you know, he was one of the guys who made it out of Alaska, who, who went to the NBA, and I couldn't get in. Whole, I couldn't. You know, I, I never got in contact with him. So. Now, and, you know, this, I knew this a long, long time ago, you know, I knew it a long time ago that I was going to help. I wanted to work with young people. And I saw that my freshman year of college, how much I enjoyed it. And then freshman year of college, I went and went over to camp. I, uh, freshman year of college, I did my very first camp back home. I like 60 kids. It was so much fun. It was cool. And I was like, oh man, I love this. I enjoy this. this is, I'm 20 years old, 19 years old. You know what I mean? I'm still a kid. And I, I was just, I literally just said to myself, I was like, man, we never had camps growing up. I'm going to go home and do a basketball camp this summer, right after my freshman year of college. Next summer, I went over to Haida Gwaii. I did Skid again um, in Masset. And I did one, and I think I did Prince Rupert. Then after those three, then the next summer I did like eight camps and then 10 camps. And then that's how it kind of progressed was like, okay, you know, you know, you could put me and <laughs> you could put me in a room of, of 100 first graders. I'm going to have that, that, that gym it right. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to make sure that gym is active and moving, even if there's 100 first graders to uh, me working with, you know, a bunch of high schoolers. Like the approach is going to be different, but I'm always going to make sure that it's an inclusive, you know what I mean? That space is inclusive. So like as time went on, I just knew, I, I knew that I wanted to, I knew that I wanted to do more than, than just play. Like I wanted to coach, I wanted to mentor and I wanted to make sure that I was going to be the mentor that I always wanted. I always needed, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Hey, no doubt. No doubt. Let's get back to that, bro. Because I don't know if a lot of people know, but like, I would say you walked away in your prime, you know, like, like right at the peak of your career, you literally just like, you know, you, you make the NBA, you, you get your cup of coffee with the Celtics, but you also get to play in the, the D league, you know, like, which is pretty much like if you're in the D league, like the, at any moment you could get a call and be like, Hey, we need you right to, to go back into the NBA and stuff. Uh, afterwards you go to, you go to uh, Europe for a little bit, but like, is it, 
were you like spiteful, uh, like towards basketball or like, like what made you just like give up, like not give up, like you reached the pinnacle of, of mm -hmm. basketball, right? Like you literally yeah. made the NBA. So I wouldn't say that, you know, you gave up, but like, was there like a, a certain level of like, oh man, I don't want to do like, this took so much for me. I'm good. Or like, like what was the process of you getting from the NBA, like out of basketball completely and just like cutting that chapter off? I just, uh, I mean, like my, my, my senior year, my quote in high school, my senior year, my quote was, um, if all I'm remembered for is being a good basketball player, I've done nothing with my life. You know what I mean? That's I'm 17. Like I'm a kid, you know? And like, I was always, my mindset was like, I I'm, I'm, I'm looked at my value from the time I was, and this is what people don't understand. When I talk about AAU as a business, college basketball as a business, from the time I was 15 years old, my value was dependent on my size, athletic and athletic ability. You know what I'm saying? So like I had people in my life who wanted to be in my life as a 15 year old kid, and I go from a fifth being a 15 year old kid to now I'm a 16 year old kid playing in Ketchikan High School, a bigger school. It's 4A. I have my own apartment. I'm getting a weekly allowance. You know what I mean? A bunch <laughs> of little things are happening for me. So, but I'm like, of course I'm taking it because I'm in survival mode. Of course I'm letting teachers pass me for you know what I mean. Of course I'm going to take all of these things. Of course I'm going to take it because I come from I come from struggle. I come from a tough environment. So when people are willing to like take care of me in a sense, even though like I didn't know how to put language behind that, I knew that I was like I was a piece of me in a sense. And I don't think people really understand that like once you once you start climbing these ladders and stuff, you you have to be very very weary of the people you have around you. So like that's what started to happen. So fresh, like all through college, even like my if uh, if my coaches could sum me up, sometimes a lot of them would say I was distracted. But what I wouldn't even look at it as being distracted. Like my sophomore through senior year at college at Oral Roberts University, I was DJing. <laughs> I was DJing like every weekend. I was, you know what I mean? Like I was having like that was I was all I was trying to search so hard for like an ad identity away, you know. And I would say it wasn't even it was it wasn't bitterness. It would it'd be looked at as bitterness because of like how it kind of progressed. But once I'm telling you, like when I made the Celtics, I got there. Once I got to dap up KG, Kevin Garnett, and some of these guys as a player, not as a fan, I was like, I'm good. Like, and it's funny. <laughs> and, and, and if I was hearing it, I'd be like, What the hell? Like, what's wrong with you? You know what I mean? But at the same time, I'm like, in order for you to understand the why behind that thought process, you'd have to understand, like, go back to when I was 14, when I left my hometown, you know what I mean? When I started being looked at a certain way, when I started being having things given to me, when I started having to, like, really, really defend myself, I had this big old chip on my shoulder. That's what that created, you know what I mean? Because everyone had these assumptions of, oh, the big athlete, blah, blah, you're going to be another Haida kid, you're going to be another village boy who drinks his career away. And those people were saying those things when I was a kid. Like, people were actively coming to me telling me that adults were saying that about a kid you know what i mean mm -hmm. so like when it comes to like the identity as a basketball player i was trying to escape that when i was like 16 17 but at the same time i knew that in order for me to in order like i knew that basketball wasn't be my vehicle you know what i mean like once i once i got to the celtics okay i got there d league and then i'm like in my mind i'm like okay i, I had an option to go back to the d league next year and i was like okay i don't want to do that i'm cool on chasing that dream it's like it's it's very 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 cutthroat in the D League because like you said anyone could get a call up. Five, I had three draft picks on my D League team. I had multiple guys who had played who were all Americans in college. And that's what people don't understand is like once you get to those levels, D League even you know you go to Europe, and everyone's all American over there as well because all those guys who get pushed out the NBA where are they going to Europe? You know what I mean? So I went to the next year that next year after the Celtics and everything the D League I went to Turkey. I was an is what creates a lot of that that feelings around the sacrifice was i'm in istanbul turkey for a year this is when it's like going crazy and the syrian refugees are coming border and i go to i go to the to the grocery store no one speaks english i get in a cab no one speaks english a lot of my teammates barely speak english that whole entire year because of what was going on my i didn't feel comfortable with my son's mother and her, my son's mother and him traveling to see me in the middle east you know what i mean so i didn't see my son for eight months you know and if, you, if anyone knows me, like my son is like, that's my rock. Because I always made a point. I always made sure that no matter what, one is an, is a black and indigenous man, I'm not going to, I'm going to be a father. I'm going to show up. You know what I mean? And those first couple of years, that's what I talked to my mentors about. I was like, man, I miss my son. Boo. And they're just like, you know, you're sacrificing right now. Your son's not going to remember these times. It's mama's time in a sense, you know? And he was, uh, he was four. You know what I mean? That, yeah, he was four when I eventually got to the point of like, I'm done. 
so a big part of it i think it was like just a lot of like the overall journey of me like being like i've been gone for 10 11 years and during that time people understand like i could speak my language if you put me with my mom for a day or two like i i could like go on and teach people an immersion type setting you know what i mean like i have the gift from her during those 10 11 years all those elders that i look like they all started passing away you know what i mean so folks will understand like i and I, I was gone i left my culture i left my people left my community and i knew it was for the greater good but once i got to a certain point like four years ago when i was about to sign to go to greece it was for good money you know and prior to that i played in italy had a solid year in italy prior year before that i played in finland and i was about to go to greece and i was sitting there and i was like i'm good like <laughs> i'm done like i don't and i'm not angry about it i'm just i'm just done i'm not i'm not happy with this anymore I need to see my son because what's going to happen is I'm going to go over to Europe and I'm going to be depressed because I'm going to miss my son. You know, and that's, that's my rock. Like, I don't, you know, I don't really, that's that, that the big, the biggest driving force was be having more time with my son and then being able to connect back to my culture, you know? And as soon as I retired, you know, everything started organically happening where I got my job in Juneau, Alaska. Um, there's a Haida population there. I, so I joined their dance group. I led their dance group. Um, I was teaching Haida classes in Juneau. You know what I mean? Like everything all aligned the right way so I could be connected back to the things I needed to be connected to. And then four years ago, when I was done, I was like, all this trigger started happening because I went home more. You know what I mean? And all these things of my like memory coming up from the time the first time i was called the n-word is a first grader you know what i mean and i was called the n-word on a daily basis growing up so all this trauma had literally like i'm telling you four years ago like, all this trauma literally just hit me at once i'm like oh man i have to like figure out how to navigate through this you know all of these memories of all the things that happened to me all hit me at once so i went through i went through three white therapists who couldn't, who couldn't help you know what i mean and that was my thing is like how are you like, you can't tell me about my trauma because you've never experienced my trauma you don't know my trauma you know you have no idea and that's where i saw that's why the men's stuff happened and started happening was i saw there was no resources i couldn't get connected with like a, 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 a therapist who could like understand me or or, or really feel me and uh that's when i started like just creating men's spaces in a sense and like spending time with men because i was more so like curious to, like no it's like am i the only one who feels like this am i the only guy who struggles like this and that's why i started having these very very vulnerable conversations with men um but yeah like it, it i would say it was just it was a big it was kind of a summer uh, like a sum up of all of the like the years and years of of being looked at as an athlete being taken advantage of um folks wanting something from me as soon as i made the nba man I, everyone was in my dms asking me to sponsor this <laughs> sponsor that you know what i mean like everyone everyone like my family i i i was the i was the prior to that i was the emotional support person for my family and once it once that name starts flashing on tv everyone thinks you're a millionaire you know what i mean so like <laughs> Everyone's blowing my stuff up, like asking for this. And my family's asking for money all the time. Oh, I know you got money, boo, you know? And like, I mean, I did well, like I made good money and everything, but it's like, it's not what everyone thinks. You know what I mean? Like that, that, that life goes really, really fast. But I think, yeah, like I said, I, it was just an overall summary of just like a lot of, a lot of um, difficult times. But at the same time, I was th thankful because I don't get to do what I do without basketball. And one of my mentors, he said to me, he's a cultural guy. He uh, he was talking about. He said, you know, Damon, you. This was two years ago. He's like, you don't need basketball anymore, but there, you're not Damon without basketball. You know what I mean? Like yeah. basketball brought me out of the Heidelberg. Basketball brought me around the world. I've been to every state in, in in on Turtle Island. I've been to I've been to 16 countries. You know what I mean? I've been I've been all over, and uh, that's why I, I just yeah, once I got to that point, I was like, I'm I'm good. Like I checked all the boxes. I didn't like I didn't reach my potential. I know that you know I didn't I know where I know where even nearly reached my potential, and one of my trainers talks about that, and he he was messaging me back in april because again i don't i didn't really i don't really dive into the specifics of my career it's easy for people to google it and, and any real ones who understand hoop they'll see the career and they'll go okay like you know you know what it is so my my trainer was we were laughing back in the spring because when COVID happened a bunch of sports writers they did this big article in the last in the anchorage daily news and what they did was they researched and they did a big list of the best basketball players ever come out of alaska statistics like they did a big ranking thing right and they put me as I think number four, or number five, like ever. And when I saw that, I was like, I just kind of was like, oh, cool, that's cool. But I was like, oh damn, I didn't know I was number one in like top five in points all the time of any of Alaskans at the division one level. Oh, I didn't know I was number one in rebounding. I didn't know these things. You know what I mean? And I'm like, and I think I'm number two in all time wins at the division one level. 
and my trainer was talking about that. He was like, you know, real, real ones. No, you know, like if you were, <laughs> if you cut out all the distractions, like you'd probably be in the NBA still, but I don't even, I don't look at it as distractions. I was finding myself, you know what I mean? I was finding things that made me happy. And like, I knew that a long, long time ago. I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to do this forever. You know, like I get to go travel and I get to go see other countries. So I'm just going to take advantage of the game for a while. So I think that was it too. Yeah. It was a big part of it. Hey, that's dope. Let, let's touch a little bit on uh, what what she said, bro. Because like I couldn't imagine like uh, the 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 struggle of being Afro Indigenous in inside of an Indigenous community. You know, like I know people kind of throw a blanket on it, but there is a lot of you know like hate and racism and stereotypes. You know, and then even take it a step further. Like you're the big basketball player, right? Like you're the star athlete of the village. And they're like, you know, do they embrace you? But they also have these stereotypes about you. And, you know, like you're only good because, you know, you're black. And like there's so many like different things that probably are getting thrown at you by your own people. Like, yeah. but, And like you said, you enrich yourself so much in the indigenous culture and being Haida. And you're so proud of who you are. And then you're looking around and you're like, yo, like these people don't have me like, you know, like I have them. So like, what, what, what is that like, bro? Like, cause I couldn't imagine trying to like do all of what you're doing, you know, like playing basketball and doing all that while also bouncing that man. Like, and have you like kind of took that a little step further and been like, yo, like I need to work this out in the indigenous community. So we, we make a comfortable space for Afro indigenous. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just by just by me, you know, just by me being visible in a sense, you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. just by me being visible. That's created attention. That's created awareness in a sense, and just be very honest with my story and my experiences. And as I started traveling the country, and I started, started traveling Indian country, I was meeting a lot of Afro Indigenous people. And I'm like, yeah, like, it's just as bad here. You know what I mean? <laughs> and we don't. But again, the more I've learned about trauma and I've learned about the tactics by the government, then I started to understand the why. You know what I mean? So you think about this. What culture did all of our grandparents and our aunties and uncles watch young people adopt? The black culture. How many kids, how many guys, you know, want to be SoundCloud rappers, but don't know their language, their, their native language? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> that's what, you know, seriously, though, you know what I mean? Like, we're, we, we, our elders, like, watched, like, in their lifetimes. That's why I, I, I would hear, like, elders dropping the N-bomb and, like, looking, you know what I mean? But it's the divide and conquer methods. You know what I mean? Like these systems were created because they knew if you put if you if indigenous and black people work together, that's not a good thing for the for you know for the oppressors. So that that's back hundreds of years. You know what I mean? Hundreds of years they were using they're using black people as BI eight as Indian agents on certain reservations. You know what I mean? Like they're you they're they're finding any way to possibly do is like to divide and conquer us. So with my journey, you know, I've 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 done a lot of work around understanding the why behind people's projections and, and learning my pre and by by understanding other people's, I had to like dive into my projections. You know what I mean? And and, and that's what we don't like, we have to like kind of take accountability in a sense, looking like, okay, how have I projected on people? How have I taken out my anger, my bitterness towards people? That's a big part of it is just these last couple of years, honestly, like I'm I got into reconciliation with my hometown in a sense. Because when I when I, when I, when the Celtics, um, when I can't, when I did those articles, I was, I'm honest, I was honest. I was brutally honest. Like, Hey, I grew up in this, this, and this, I grew up around this folks didn't like that. As you can imagine, you know what I mean? Because you're letting, you're kind of letting out the, the dirty laundry, you know, and you're putting it out there and it just so happens. I'm putting out the dirty laundry on one of the biggest platforms in the world, you know, <laughs> Boston, the Boston Globe. So like folks back home weren't happy. And exactly that though, is that I would see that as like, I'd go to other villages. And, and, and again, it's so humbling. Like I go to villages and villages shut down in a sense. Like the whole town comes out. They do like a community celebration. We have a dinner. Like we'll have like a, a community basketball game where all the guys want to come and play open gym. And like the whole town comes out just because I'm there. And it's so, so extremely humbling. When I was traveling, I was like, man, these people roll out the red carpet for me. They love, show me so much love. But I go back home and I get no love. And I had to look at that. And there's this quote that says, um, do you know why people, do you know why strangers support you more than people you know? It's because the people you know have a hard time accepting that you both came from the same exact place and they're still there. You know what I'm saying? So like, that's a big part of it too, is like, that's again, the lateral oppression. So think about how many folks are go get educated or go off there, leave their communities. Oh, you think you're better than us now, huh? <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's like, again, it's just, it's the divide and conquer. So being Afro indigenous, I, uh, I, I was ashamed to be black. You know what I mean? As a kid, like I was ashamed to be black because I was constantly co told I was an N word every day. You know what I mean? By adults at open gym, when I talk about the survival method mode, 
I'm being called the N-word by adults at open gym. Then I go to school, I'm being called the N-word. You know what I mean? So like I had like this 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 feeling towards being black that I didn't want to be black because of what it the pain it brought me. So I didn't, it's funny, I didn't really identify with my black side. I really started coming into that. One, like my dad left when I was a kid. Like I never I didn't meet my father until I was 20 years old. He's black. And I didn't so again see that like there's this that's how I was projecting and I, I used to think I had daddy issues, you know, but, <laughs> but my wounds, my wounds, my wounds, the more I dove in my wounds, I realized it was more so mother issues, you know what I mean? And that's what we see a lot too. Like the work I do and the men I have conversations with, you're able to see that a lot of this pain and anger comes from mommy issues rather than daddy issues, like we you know, like we naturally think. So I had this bitterness, anger and um, I, yeah, I didn't really connect with my black side until I started playing AAU when I was with all black teams, you know what I mean? And uh, I, I told you about the two AAU teams I played with, but I played with one other AAU team, like that friends hoop team. The guys were like, they weren't really like, some of them were from tougher areas, but like, they were all, you know, they were, they're all right. Like, a couple of them went to like private schools and stuff. You know what I mean? I, going into my junior year, I played with a team for like two tournaments only. I played for Compton. <laughs> so like my... <laughs> Was Compton, like we were staying, we were staying, like the house I was staying on, like two miles from Compton. So, like, we're in Compton, like, every day, and I'm seeing the oppression. You know what I'm saying? I'm seeing mm -hmm. the simple oppression. I'm like, this is like a, a village or a reservation, these these situations they're living in, right? So, I got so I started to connect to my black side more. So, it was like, I felt comfortable being like, I'm around black people all the time now, you know what I mean? And like, it's a whole, it's like, it just it, it gives you a certain type of like empowerment when you're able to be around people who, um, you you know where they they look like you even more so where i'm back home, home in heidelberg and we all talk real haida and everything i have a real haida accent, but uh that we don't i don't look like anybody there you know so like coming into that it was a lot of work to really understand. but the more I, i've done my work i've realized like all the 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 pain and everything that spread that that identity was all because of the divide and conquer the oppressors they created those systems to divide us you know yeah, do do you see a lot of similarities between um just the stuff that I guess like you being uh half in, half indigenous, half um Afro Indigenous, like do you see like similarities that like each of your ethnicities go through? Because like even as an indigenous person, I see like a lot of stuff that the African American community goes through, even in the U.S. Like, there's a lot of uh, similarities of like what we go through over here as First Nations people. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, it's uh, and that's why I always say is uh, that's why I'm I, I I joke with people like that's why I'm I mean I'm resilient because of the trauma, but the same. Like I have a lot of very powerful ancestors. You know, what I mean, I come from like I have, I have slavery in my DNA. I have gen genocide in my DNA. You know what I mean? Like I have I have two very very powerful bloodlines and that's how i look at it i didn't step into the both of them until until i really started to understand the power of history you know what i mean and like like i said like when i was in the hood when i was in compton like i was looking around like damn like our oppression is the same but it's being it's like it's it's created like this for a reason you know and they've divided and they've conquered us so they want to divide us even more so it's working and i i see myself um, with these conversations when it comes to mental health, when it comes to black and indigenous, Afro indigenous, like I've become kind of a prompt for that conversation, you know, because I could speak on both worlds. I've been in both worlds heavily, you know, I have like, I have, you know, I have people in my network from both worlds. So I've been able to like really live in both worlds. So I've been able to like really understand and be honest about, you know, how, how, how folks are treated in the reservation or how folks are treated in, in the village if you're, if you're Afro indigenous. So, um, yeah, the oppression is the same. And that's why I have had to say that is like, if we took a step back and acknowledge the history of both sides, we understand like we need to be working together. You know what I mean? Like we need to find ways to collaborate. And that's why, um, I started advocating specifically for black and indigenous men, because those two demographics, one, you know, one in one in five black men are going to be in prison their lifetime. You know what I mean? And up in Alaska, Alaska Native men, we represent 6% of the whole entire state of Alaska's population, but we represent 38% of the prison population. You know what I mean? Like, and I'm, I can guarantee the, the conversations over there are the same exact statistics over your guys' territories with First yeah. Nations. Think about how many First Nations men are locked up right now and will probably never leave. And if they do leave, think about how many of them are even going to get access to the right health care or mental health. You know what I mean? All those guys are going to be right back in prison because there's no support for them. So I think it's, yeah, being able to see like both the indigenous and black men are, are very oppressed groups, obviously.
And um, it's, yeah, so like just my, through my life experience, I mean, I've been very fortunate to be able to have these conversations. Yeah, bro. Like, I, th I think it's really important too, like, like as somebody that can relate at, at the athlete level too, you know, like, and just, just having, like, I think that weighs heavy on somebody. Like I know River can kind of talk about this too, but like you're saying, man, it's like, you get people that are from your hometown or from your home community or that watch you like grow up. And th most of the time they're all better than you. They, they, they have the talent, they have the ability that they, they just, for some reason it just doesn't work for them and it works for you. And it's like the quick thing to just be like, Oh, well, why am I not where you're at? You know? And it's easier to tear you down than to ask that question of themselves. So I think that that was something that, that I, I like to, to acknowledge and recognize too. I know river, you can kind of uh, talk a little bit about this too, because you know, it's something that we're going through right now, even, you know, like just with, with this platform that we have, it's like people, there, there's people out there that just don't, don't, don't see it or don't want it to, to evolve or, you know, it's like, we're, we're doing some corny or it's like, bro, like we're the same people off this camera. You know what I mean? Like we're not putting on for nobody. We're just doing it. So I, I know river is kind of a little bit more strong worded about it. So I just want to hear what you got to say about this. Cause this is an important topic in kind of the bigger picture of, you know, like mental health and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, like I said, it's, just, it's the, it's the, the, the lateral oppression and uh, the crabs in the bucket syndrome. I don't know if you heard that when one crab, yeah. You know, the, the bucket, the rest of the crabs are, you know, uh, shaking it and everything trying to get them back in and uh again like once i learned more about that and everything that gave me a better understanding so i, I you know I, for i'll give you an example um a couple of years ago two years ago i was in juno and one of my cousins he's the first one to ever call me the n-word it's messed up he brought me <laughs> we're in like first grade or second grade and he bring me like he shows me the globe this is so messed up he, he shows the globe in front of the whole class and the country and i g e r right and like he's like you know like and he's like like laughing about it boom boom as time went on this like he terrorized me you know what i mean my whole yeah like i was like and i was i was bigger than people but i was had no confidence i was very insecure you know what i mean so i, I didn't know how to like stick up for myself and i wasn't a violent person i don't like i, I if i have to fight you know what I mean? but i i grew up not like i don't want to fight you know what i mean like that's just not my thing it never has been my thing i'm not interested in it um i'm not any yeah it just doesn't interest me and I was essentially bullied and like, you know, like I said, told, called the effort every single day. So two years ago, um, I'm leading this dance group and this has to do with like forgiveness and understanding why people project onto you and the why behind actions. So two years ago, I'm leading a dance group and I, and in this dance group, I, and I was very called to like guide and lead this dance group because the whole entire dance group was a lot. It was nothing but <laughs> Haida women, which is, it was very tough. Um, uh, circumstance, but I grew and I learned so much about leadership. You know what I mean? Like, if you want, if you want to test your leadership skills, put yourself with a bunch of native women. Like, I, it was, <laughs> yeah. seriously, like, because I had to learn how to like. I was too caught up in like the coaching. You know what I'm saying? Rather yeah. than like, like emotional, like really like connecting with them and supporting them, and like you know what I mean? Just like in my my basketball, like pushing people, pushing this dance, but also like making sure being soft and gentle with them. And that get, they taught me so, so much. But anyways, in this dance group, there was three young boys. They were all, the, all their moms are single mothers. So I was very called, you know what I mean? And they're all, all these boys were freaking 10 to 13 years old. So like, you know what I mean? Like that is a very, very in the right circumstance. I think the dance group teach these young boys how to dance, teaching these young boys how to say, these young boys how to keep their head and have confidence, like a strong height of man. And um, one of the boys, father's is my cousin okay this my husband he was on he's always in in and out of treatment during that time and i found out he was in town i hadn't spoken to him in years years and years and years and i was like f that guy basically you know once i like quote unquote made it um and i was like that for a lot of people but it's time i had to do the work like understand like okay like i don't care about like i have no ill feelings towards anyone that's hurt me that told me i wasn't gonna make it told me i wasn't gonna be successful because you know where as we come up we're like oh we have to prove the haters wrong and Aha, uh -huh, my haters, blah, blah, blah. Like, that's such a, that's such a stupid, like, um, I mean, it is because like, if we're, if we're spending all energy trying to prove the haters wrong, then how are we going to show up for the people who want to see us do well? You know what I mean? And that's what I had to realize. Like, there's a lot of people who want to see me do well. So I'm going to focus on them. So my cousin comes into town and uh, I uh, reached out to him. I, again, hadn't spoken to him in years. 
I picked him up and everything. Like I brought so his uh, we we went, I brought him and his son to his apartment because he was staying there for a while. Like he was waiting for a bed and treatment, right? And I was like, hey, this guy's trying. I'm not doing this for him. I'm doing this for his son because his son deserves a father. You know, what I mean, his son's a good, good guy, good kid. So I pick up his son and him, and I take them grocery shopping. And I, you know, I, I got them groceries and everything. I brought, dropped them off, and his son goes inside, and he breaks down crying. His his uh, his dad starts crying. And uh, he was just like, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how I treated you. I'm sorry for those things to you. I'm like, dude, like, I, I forget time ago. You know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, it's like you're you're far more valuable than your worst mistake. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I, I want him to understand that. Have any ill feelings towards you? All I hope is that you just be a better better man for your son. You know what I mean? Go to treatment and get the help that you need so you can show up for your son. Because he was telling me, he's like, the first time he ever saw someone get knocked out was watching his grandmother get knocked out. You know what I mean? Like he used to he used to be like have to hide in a freak like he used to have to hide you know and that thing about that's, that's a lot of our our men you know what I mean it's a lot of our men who like are like indigenous and black men we we experience discipline through violence you know what I mean like all the guys I grew up with we all got it wasn't like spanked like we all got beat you know and I look at that and I look how I was able to like. I was able to channel all that and put it towards something I really wanted. And then I saw all of the guys I grew up with kind of like go off in these different directions. And I would say, you know, there's 20, 25 guys in our, in our age range, our three year age range. So of those 25 or so, like um, one of my good friends, Greg, it was me, Greg and Claude. We're the ones who spend the most time together. Claude wrestled in college, four year degree, got a business degree. That's my brother, like iron sharpens iron. That's my, that's my absolute brother. And uh, he went on, did his thing. He, he was in seventh grade, too, said he was in a wrestling college. He went on and did it. He won two state championships in wrestling. Um, and, you know, he did what he was supposed to do. Then Greg, uh, my, best, my good friend's Greg, he's apprenticing TJ Young. TJ Young is one of Robert Davidson's main apprentices. Robert Davidson, I don't know if you guys are familiar, Robert Davidson is, he's considered by most to be the greatest Pacific Northwest artist alive right now. You go into the Vancouver, you go into Vancouver um, airports and those museums, like you're going to see Robert Davidson everywhere. Um, so I go back to that because I think that's the conversation that needs to be had is there's a lot of hurt in our communities um, and there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of intergenerational trauma. And if we could start figuring out how to put language behind all of this pain, then we're going to start progressing forward. Because all we do right now, and like I, 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 I have a hard time with, people, with our community sometimes is well, we point out a problem, but we don't provide any solutions. So when the kids I mentor come to me, when they come to me with a problem or anybody, my friend, like you have one time to come complain to me, complain and vent to me about it. You know what I mean? The next conversation is like, what are you doing now? What's next? You know, because again, like we have, we, we do, we have a poor, poor problem with that. of just sitting in the sitting in the muck in a sense, like, sitting, mm -hmm. understanding, like, okay, like how are we going to get through this? So I say that because we're, it, it's going to take a lot of conversations and a lot of work for us to progress forward and understand like we're we're doing exactly what the oppressors do. You know what I mean? Hating each other, hating on each other, tearing each other down, not lifting each other up. Um, yeah, so I think it, it's it's a, a big conversation. No, I would agree, man. And I think too, like where the conversation needs to go is that we as indigenous men, especially like uh, we, we need to be the spearhead of that. Right. And for far too long, I think we've, we've put it to the backseat, our own mental health and our own, our own demons, you know, and, and because if we're not good for ourselves, then we're not good for anybody else. Right. And, and that I think comes out, you know, in domestic violence or drug abuse or jails, you know, like there, there's a piece of a lot of us missing that, that doesn't necessarily get fed, you know, and we need to start to open that up and figure out how to feed those things the right, the, the right way. Right. You know, through call. I, and, and I, I really think too, that, you know, the beautiful ways are, are our culture, you know our language our our getting back to who we are as indigenous people you know getting back to a, a basic understanding of who we are because if we don't know who we are then how are we any good to anybody right so i would say that like just on you what you were saying with you know the first thing that we need to do i think that would be a huge thing you know is cultural and get back to culture and and language and and a basic understanding you know is there is there some more things that you know like for instance there might be some men out here watching tonight you know that that don't necessarily necessarily know what to do you know you know they, they got mental health issues yeah go ahead bro we gotta we gotta tell our homies we love them more man and and like yeah. we gotta hug our friends man like yeah. like like our brothers man like we, we literally gotta like give those guys a big hug man you have to normalize telling your friends that you love them then like you 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 want them to get home safe and everything man that's something that i that like that's wrapped in 
toxic masculinity that we can't show feelings for each other. And if it is love, it's it's tough love. But there's way too much tough love now, bro. Way too much. And 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 I'm sure Damon as well can uh, expand on all of that. Yeah. No. no I go ahead, no. Damon. Yeah, hey. we wanna we wanna know. Oh yeah, yeah. No, I just know exactly what you said. Is that same thing with me? You know, last couple of years, like I've really, I've I've lost multiple friends, male friends, because I started to understand like what I needed as far as support. I thought just being around was, you know, what I mean, like because we're we're not taught like what a good relationship is growing up. And that's why I've expressed mm -hmm. to people. So the best way I could put it with this whole entire thing moving forward in all of these conversations when it comes to the men's stuff and as we heal um, as communities is there needs to like, cause traditionally a lot of our, our people, we had men's houses and we had women's houses, you know what I mean? And those need to be brought back because men, we need to be over here in our little huddle figuring out, okay, how are we going to hug each other more? How are we going to love each other more? How are we going to hold each other accountable? Because right now, if the average man or whatever from the res or whatever, if he's pointed out by a bunch of women and said, you got, you need to do better. What are they going to do? They're going to be like, forget this. You know what I mean? That's too much pressure. Like we, we get defensive because everyone, we're all built off of ego. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. In order for us to grow, in order for us to progress forward, we, we have to eliminate the ego. We have to take the ego. We're all, everyone and our ego, our ego could be built in a good way. And it could, it could like my ego pro propelled me all the way to where I need to go. You know what I mean? Like, so, we had to, we had to, you know, like we, we need to be having these conversations separately and men need to be saying, okay, like, how do we like, what is, what is trauma? Cause I, I've, I'm telling you, I've worked with over with hundreds of men so far. And, and when I go into these spaces, like I let them know, it's like, I'm not the master of masculinity. I'm not no guru. I just have, I'm just a man with experience and I'm a good facilitator. So what I do is like, I would start going to communities who would want to book me for basketball camps. I'd be like, Hey, can I spend some time just with your boys? You know what I mean? Because like there was no resources out there for just specific men stuff, and I'd say, can I can I hang out at the can I can I reserve the community shelter or community center for all the men tonight in the community? And uh, this is the best story ever because in order for us to progress, we have to it has to come from a place of empathy, and we have to listen to each other's stories again. The reason I forgave my parents is because I listened to their whole entire story of all the trauma and everything, and then that's where we start holding each other accountable. So I heard my mom's trauma. I said, here's my my boundaries, mom. You're not crossing my boundaries anymore. I'm staying firm on them, right? And our relationship has grown so much. Like, I'm so proud of her. She's going to treatment this week. And this is after a 10-year battle, you know what I mean? Like, my, my sister's on her way. Like, there's a lot of good things happening. It's because I started, like, diving into my stuff, you know what I mean? That's what they always say. When you heal yourself, you heal your family. I'm nowhere near um, where I need to be, and I'm still working. And it's a lot of, like I said, it's a lot to unpack. And again coming from Heidelberg, no role models for men, you know what I mean? Like specifically. And I went from Heidelberg to, to, uh, being, like I said, from the time I'm 15 years old, my value was based off my athleticism, my looks, my size, all that stuff. You know what I mean? what I could do for those around me. So I just kind of, I, I kind of assumed that just took that role on, you know what I mean? I just took that identity on of like, okay, well, everyone just wants me for my physicality. Everyone just wants me for my, my athleticism. Everyone just wants me because I'm a star basketball player. So, oh, I guess I'll just give that to them. You know what I mean? So think about how <laughs> many, seriously, you know what I mean? Think about how many men are just walk, out there walking around with this fake identity. You know what I mean? Because we've been groomed and we've been taught and conditioned to think loving you, hugging your friends is gay or, or whatever the case may be is. You know what I mean? Like there's so much, there's so much homophobic, um, homophobia in our communities where we don't understand like people who 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 had who two-spirited people and different those people are held in high regard i remember as a kid i would say i said a homophobic slur and my mom got on me big time <laughs> she pressed but she was like hey we didn't we didn't do that we didn't shame shame was taught brought to us by the white people shame was brought to us by colonizers that's why we're in the state we're in is because we we, we were ashamed of ourselves because they've taught us to be ashamed of ourselves so as men like a lot of us ha a lot of us have done harm and as time has gone on and we have resources now you know what i mean like as men like how often do you guys hear about coercion growing up you know what i mean like have you ever you know what i'm saying like coercion manipulation like being persistent because we're taught as men, we got to be persistent. You know what I'm saying? Like we don't learn boundaries because we're constantly taught. We don't have any boundaries. We're constantly taught. Like we, as men, we shouldn't have any boundaries. So there's like a lot of work. And in order for us to get to that point, like when I bring these men in together, the very first question I say is, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I say this all the time. I wish that I could host 
10 sessions and have a hundred women behind a glass window that where we can't see them. You know what I'm saying? So they could watch and say, Oh wow. Like, okay. Now we're hearing the stories because very few men open up about mental health. Very few men open up about their pain and trauma. When I go into these communities, the very first question I ask is what is masculinity mean to you? And it's always to be tough, uh, to take care of my family, uh, to work hard. You know what I mean? To make money, to provide all of these things that that's so much pressure on men. You know what I mean? Like men aren't given the space to break down and not feel a certain way about it, you know? And me, I've, like I said, I've lost men in my life because they couldn't, didn't know how to hold space, for them, you know? And I'm actively, I'm actively seeking that out. And I put that in the universe of like, just put good men in my life, you know, because I'm at my best. I'm doing my best when I have men in my life who will hold me accountable. You know what I mean? And if you, and like, again, like the iron sharpens iron thing, like, like for my personal healing right now, like I'm I'm going home to Heidelberg to Alaska in two weeks. I'm gonna be there for the next six months. Um and you know, we're gonna be doing men's group with the men in the community. Like I'm I, I have a lot of healing to continue to do, you know? And that's the thing is like I'm vocal about it because um I know that I know it brings I know it helps other people. And when I started again, when I started going to communities, I started to hear these stories and I started to understand like how far we are behind in a sense when it comes to just support for men. So I think like with all men, like you said, is like, we need to hug. We need to show, tell each other we love each other. Um, and the biggest thing is we have to start creating spaces. You know what I mean? We have to start creating spaces, whether that's um, men's groups. Uh, I, you know, I tap in with guys in my, in my network here and there. We get on Zoom calls together just to check in with each other. Like we need to normalize like gathering as men because we tell each other we love each other when what's involved, when alcohol is involved. You know what I'm saying? Like think about how much. Like we won't tell each other we love each other or whatever until everyone's drinking. And then you'll never, you won't get native dudes to shut up about loving each other. You know what I mean? Like when, when alcohol is involved, like we feel comfortable, like expressing, Oh, I love you, bro. You're my bro for life. Well, but why won't we get that vulnerable when we're sober? You know what I mean? And because it's because we have so much suppressed because of all these stigmas, because of all these expectations. So it's a, it's, it's in a, a long evolving conversation but I don't think enough people are having the conversation. And I think it, it frustrates me because I get to see the pain in all these young boys. You know what I'm saying? Like I see all these young boys who are struggling, who I'm feeling like these boys are going to get left behind when it comes to like their role in society. You know what I mean? When it comes to their identity, because um, constantly it's like all men are trash right now. And, you know, there's constant narratives of how, how bad native men are in a sense. And again, like we have, we have been a big part of all the, the harm in our communities, but we have to acknowledge, like we haven't had time to unpack the generational trauma. You know what I mean? Like think about in your lifetime, you guys, like think about how many times you've had a conversation with men about trauma. You know what I mean? Like it's not, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a common conversation. So for the men watching, like that's what I would encourage is start telling your boys, you love them, tell them, you know, start, you know, practicing healthy um bonding you know and that's what I, that's kind of the steps i express to people is like in order for men to be able to show up for the community and love other people we have to learn how to love ourselves and a lot of us don't love ourselves you know what i mean and like i, I i've like i've dove in a lot with like mike tyson and i've learned about his journey and that's what he's talking about i was like we're constantly projecting because we don't love ourselves you know what i mean we're constantly doing things like that we know could harm people but it's because we don't love ourselves but and so in order for us to be able to show up for our community is like we have to figure out how to love ourselves and love each other you know what i mean and then we're gonna be able to be better allies for our women and then we're gonna be able to be better fathers but the work has it starts with like eliminating as much eliminating the shame but by eliminating the shame you have to like you have to figure out how you know you, re you reconcile because there's not even that either you know what i mean there's no there's no spaces for reconciliation for men who have caused harm. There are in some cultures and some places, but I, you don't see it very often. So it's either like, are we just going to throw away all men? Or are we going to figure out a way to create resources and create spaces for us to heal? Otherwise, all of our, our, our nephews and our, our sons, they're going to get left behind in a sense. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so like just from hearing your story, man, it, it sounds like you didn't really have a positive male figure in your life and that didn't come until your coach and your mentor do you think you'd be doing what you're doing today without that guy are those male figures coming in to save you and like the reason why i ask this is just because i feel like you can make an example for the people listening that like 
we need these positive male figures and that we don't have enough of them and that luckily you ended up getting one and like this is what helped you succeed and this is what pushed you but um a lot of first nations youth don't have the resources they they, they don't have that they they have um fathers who aren't present you, you know what i mean that's the toughest thing no yeah no like i said i i tell people all the time if i don't if i don't eat meet march uh if i don't meet archie i manage from high school then i don't make it i mean like there's no and ifs or buts you know because again he was hard on me dude like i still have coaches who come up to me and be like man you remember that one time when so <laughs> We're at a basketball tournament my sophomore year. I'm fresh off the of MCL tear, and uh, I go to Duncan. It's a big game. We're playing with like the number two ranked four A team in the state of Alaska. Like we have a powerhouse three A team. We have a bunch of studs. And it's a big. There's a lot of like hype around this game, and I'm like, it's kind of my coming out party during during that tournament. It's like the first tournament of the year. Um, but we're in a in the game, and I went up to dunk the ball, and I missed the dunk, and my coach lost it. Damn it! Damn it! Oh, he was losing it. And I go and miss another dunk because I don't have my legs under me. You know what I mean? So I don't have my legs under me. I miss another one. He goes, damn it, damn it. If you try to dunk again, you will never play for me again. <laughs> and I was talking with my coach. I was talking with some coaches like that. We're at that game like back in the day. So that's been cool too. It's like I've connected with a lot of coaches who have got to watch the journey. And we were talking about that. And they're like, they're like, we were up in the corner. Like, yeah, okay, Archie. Good. Like, you're, yeah, okay. Like, you're going to really see. We hope you stick to your word. Then we'll have him come to our school. You know what I mean? But people, people would always be like, man, he's so hard on you. He, you know what I mean? And my mom was, there was a lot of times where my mom wanted to come out of that crowd and, and, and you know, and get, and give him a, a, pe uh, a earful. And she always say, like, she would always stay out of it. Um, and that's what we had, you know, but because people saw how hard he was on. He was so, so hard. I mean, we taught her to this day and he said she's he could have done things a lot differently because he was a young coach at the time you know what i mean so he and he never he didn't like he didn't know what to do with me you know like think about being a coach and be like oh man like if i don't if he doesn't go where he where he has the potential to go then i didn't do my job so like as i learned as a mentor as a coach like man that's a lot of pressure on him you know what i mean so he was just on me all the time but people i always tell people that people will they saw all of that but they didn't see me in his office every week crying you know and i mean they didn't see him coming to pick me up on sunday when i'm depressed or anxious and my family's fighting and i'm a, i'm the only lifeline i'm the i'm the one who has to provide all the emotional support they didn't see when he's coming to pick me up on a sunday and bring me to sunday, uh, friday night lights you know what i mean like hmm. those are the things that matter those are the things that i'll always say in my heart is like he gave me time and as men like if we could just give people time time is the most valuable thing there is so that's why i always express to people it's not about it's not about you know being the master of masculinity or being the perfect man it's about starting somewhere you know what i mean we're all on this journey you know and we have to figure out how we're all going to eventually get to this final stopping point you know and that's kind of the thing is that I've, I've i've realized how important it was for him to be in my life and again like if i don't meet him then i don't i don't make it mm -hmm. but he was yeah, hey. by, by far vital person ever yeah that's dude uh I'm gonna go quickly, uh, Ray. Uh, do you read yeah. books much? Yeah. So, um, I, so I kind of talk about the mentor. Um, it's uh, uh, Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, like, that's and uh, and I'll, uh, I always post the diagram, but that's literally it, it's the hero's journey sums up so many of our indigenous legends. You know what I mean? And our and mm -hmm. like leaving your leaving what's comfortable, going to the unknown, finding your mentor, trials and tribulations, death and rebirth, atonement, return with the gift. You know, and that's my, I went out and I got a lot of skills. Now, unfortunately I have the, I have the capacity and I have the, the, the skills and I have the network and resources in a sense to go and help my community because I left, you know what I mean? So that's what we have to capture too for our young people is there's nothing like, there's nothing wrong with going, like being on the res, but go off and get some experiences if you, if need be, depending on what you want to do, but find something where you can positively impact and contribute to your community. You know, and you don't have, have to do anything crazy, like just giving people your time. So I think that's the biggest part I would start with our men is like, just start something. You know what I mean? Like when yeah. I started, I didn't know what I was doing. I literally just, I, I, I've built a curriculum for, um, for men's spurt circles now. And I'm more than willing to share that with people because I, I literally was like, I gathered a bunch of men. I was like, let's talk <laughs> like let's let's talk about some stuff and 
as time went on, I, I gang, I figure out which questions to ask. I figured mm -hmm. out like how to like sh get this group of men comfortable with even sharing those things. Cause that's scary too, you know? So I think that would be it. Like, we have to start somewhere, you know, like we can't, we can't, we can't sit around anymore and point at the problems or this the issues without what are we going to do about solutions? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. No, I just asked because you were talking about like, um, uh, like what do we earlier you were saying like what do we do with men right like do we like banish them or do we like have spaces for them when they make mistakes and they come from jail and like i want to recommend this book to you it's called okay. returning to the teachings by rupert ross and it's yeah. about um aboriginal justice it's not like the the same systems that were put to us by settlers right this is like how they've dealt with things in the past and like whenever somebody would commit what is now considered a crime it's just like yeah. how the different tribes um dealt with it and it's really, really interesting it's uh i got like three four chapters into it and i kind of took a break but like it's it's a really really good book i feel like you'd benefit oh, from it what was it called returning to the teachings Rupert okay Rupert. yeah cool. yeah exploring aboriginal justice really good book really good book okay, for sure Hey, dope, bro. We're gonna switch it up a little bit, bro. I want to talk to you a little bit about res ball, bro. Just a little bit because I feel like you know we don't gotta talk about the pro stuff, but tell us a little bit about res ball, bro. Like you come from like the village that's like known for res ball, man. I watched this video, bro. Like, um, it was like at a all native championships or something like that, bro. Yeah. And you like you like hit a like a dagger with like like I think you guys were down too, and you hit like a like a, a disgusting shot in somebody's face, bro. It was nasty. But <laughs> talk to us about what res ball means, bro. Like you ever you still like if you still do hoop, do you still like is it just res ball or like are you just like done from hooping completely? And I um I mean I've played in like some of those native tournaments like I that that turn of that year um that was yeah a couple of years ago that was such an interesting dynamic that was such an interesting time um but yeah like I I it was funny because like uh, I was talking to somebody about that and they're like oh man like why weren't you like scoring forty boom you know what I mean like I had like big games and everything in these tournaments but I'm so used to playing very structured basketball you know what I'm saying make the right pass like that's like and like you know it's freaking res ball it's run and gun shoot a bunch of threes you know what i mean so like i i it was a it, honestly it was like a, a a weird transition for me you know what i mean like i've never gotten to a point where i'm saying where, or give me the ball every single possession i'm gonna go score 60 because I'm, I'm more than capable but like that doesn't even feel right to me because i'm so i've been so i mean i've been in i've been in systems for a decade you know what i mean like I've been in like structured practices every single day. I've been in structured, you know, training camps. I've had to learn, memorize freaking 30 plays. You know what I mean? 30 plus plays. I've had to learn so many different things and I'm a big basketball head. Like I, I know that's why I'm a great coach is that I could, I, I know how to teach the game and break the game down to a very minimal level. Um, and I know I have a high IQ. So like when I'm in these tournaments and everything, like even my boys, you know, me and my boys will get into it because I'm like, like I'll get mad at them for not doing this or not back cutting or not doing. And as time goes on, like I, I played, I played in city league two years ago. I had to check myself heavy, like, cause I would just like get so mad at some of these guys and I'd like take a step back and like, like all these guys even play varsity basketball in high school. You know what I mean? Like I can't, I can't be mad at these guys for missing left-hand layups. You know, it's like, it was, it's, you know, so like it, it's, I, I love the, um, I love the approach to the res ball because it brings community. That's why I love all native. Like I don't even care about winning or losing. Either. Like all native was so much fun because it was nothing but natives. You know what I mean? And you're coming out and you're showing it's, it, I think res ball is, is the summary of like community pride in a sense. You know what I mean? Cause mm -hmm. like basketball is so big and it's like, if you, if you're playing your boy from the other town, you, know, you, you want to win so bad because then you have breaking rights for the year. You know what I mean? So like that's I think res ball is such a it's it's good and at the same time I'm hoping the coaches who are coaching these guys and stuff are out, are also teaching fundamental basketball because I see that's where a lot of our um our our native folks haven't been successful at that level in college levels because you go from run and gun freedom as heck to now you're in a system now you don't get to shoot whenever you want now you have to remember a play now you have to learn how to hedge a ball screen now you have to learn how to use a ball screen you know what I mean like. So now it's like with young people, I literally take, I break it down to footwork, to ball screen, to screening, to learning how to rebound. Like I, I, I simplify as much as possible. Cause again, like res ball, it could uh, create great things as far as like learning how to play hard and everything and, and competing and, and, and having pride. 
um, at the same time, like I hope that folks who are involved in res ball or who are um, in the res or in the village are also teaching the fundamentals. Because if we want more players at the collegiate level, we can't, it's not like res ball is not going to work. Someone was like, oh yeah, Golden State Warriors are playing res ball. Well, I'm like, yeah, but those guys are also like some of the greatest shooters in the world. Like, <laughs> like Steph, Steph Curry, Steph Curry also like grew up, his dad's Del Curry. Steph Curry's been working with NBA players since he was about five years old, along with Clay Thompson. You know what I mean? Like, people will see that and be like, oh man, let's play like the Warriors running gun. It's like, well, go put the work in as well. Like, go shoot a thousand jumpers. You know what I mean? Like, work on your game. So I think res ball is great. Um, but at the same time, I just I hope that we're also teaching the fundamentals. You know what I mean? Yeah. Did you end up winning that game when you hit that three? Oh. Because I watched it too. <laughs> we lost. We freaking, uh, so we, what happened was, so we, I mean, obviously we talk about the, the, the fake line and everything, right? The fake border that's, uh, that was put in place and everything. And Heidegwai separated from Heidelberg. You know what I mean? So for the tournament, like the, the ferry got shut down. So we had like, we had three guys who had to take a boat six hours across to Canada, you know? And they made it across, so we're at all native. And my point guard Vinny, he's he was easily the probably he's you know the second best player in the whole entire tournament. So um, we won our first couple of games, and I mean everyone kind of saw the writing on the wall, you know what I mean? So, um, so we won our first couple of games, and just so happens our 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 brothers, our relatives called RCMP on those guys. So those guys got picked up from the hotel, like people deliberately pointed out exactly which hotel room you know what i mean so it's like it speaks volumes of lateral oppression of us going to the rcmp to turn in our own people you know what i mean but it was because everyone knew we were going to win the tournament like we were you know and and like when that happened three of those guys were three of our starters you know what i mean so like we had to fly guys in for the turn for the, just to have enough for our, our 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 so we those guys all got um picked up friday afternoon right we played that night with five, I think six, five guys. We played that night with five guys. We won, or we lost. The next morning, we had to like we had guys fly over from Alaska the next morning. Like our one of our, our you know, we one of the guys. He's you know he he has money and everything, so he had to like charter a plane to bring guys over just so we'd have enough guys to play. You know what I mean? So like it was like and it's not like excuses or whatever. Like we should have we we should have won that game, but it uh it 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 was like, it was a good experience and a tough experience. It was good because it really sh shined a light on those fake borders and how we need to eliminate those. You know what I mean? Yeah. So the Heidelberg, our, our uh, Heidelberg folks and Heidegwai folks are having a lot of, a lot of conversations um, with the government on how we're going to eliminate those lines. You know what I mean? And actually truly honor the J treaty, which um, shouldn't even be in place. Yeah. That's yeah. true. You ever, you, can... uh, you ever uh, dunk on a, one one of your fellow tribesmen, bro. <laughs> I've got somebody at a red sturdy. Um, I've I've I've, I've caught some bodies. <laughs> caught some bodies. No, when I go to these tournaments, man, like you'll you won't you you'll very rarely see me post up. I'm just gonna shoot a bunch of threes and I'm gonna make sure I don't roll an ankle. <laughs> <laughs> bro, next one, bro. MJ or LeBron, man. We gotta know. LeBron, bro. Hey, let's go. Um, man, we, it, hey. Why? I mean, I've been I've been a LeBron fan since I was. He was he was on the cover of ESPN at 14. You know what I mean? And I'm a LeBron fan because of Le LeBron more so as the person. You know what I'm saying? Like 10, he's put 10,000 kids through college. He has the I Wish School in Akron, Ohio, which also offers GEDs to the kids' parents. They get three meals a day from that school. Um, you talk about like he he single handedly has changed the whole entire power of the NBA. You know what I'm saying? LeBron is the most powerful athlete in the world, and his brand is bigger, bigger or as big as the NBA now. Because if you think of the NBA, who do you think about? You look on Sports Center, they're talking about the NBA. Who are you gonna see? You know what I mean? Like Crucial. social. <laughs> so, you know <laughs> I mean? <laughs> Alex, excuse me. You know, social justice. When it comes to like, he's given. So he he he's like shifted all this power from the owners to the players just in ten years. You know what I mean? where the NFL, they're starting to catch on too as far as finding voices. But, man, like LeBron, the way he he mentors all the young players and everything, like you'll, you'll look up some of these viral videos and he'll be at these AU tournaments watching 15-year-old kids. You know what I mean? Like he mentors like everybody and anyone. And, like, you know, you look about it, like a family man. Um, he's had no hiccups as far as from a personal standpoint. You've never heard anything bad about LeBron. Like the worst thing that people could say, LeBron's a flopper. LeBron, you know what I mean, like that's, that's the worst thing somebody could say about LeBron. And – like I don't mess with Jordan because Jordan and no people don't know this. 
um, Jordan, his company he works for, they were investing in a company that manages prisons. You know what I'm saying? Like he, because prisons are for profit. So a business he's involved with manages prisons. You know what I'm saying? So as a black man, he has a hand in keeping black other black men in jail. Why do you think he was so quiet when all this BLM stuff happened? You know what I mean? Like if you really look at it, you there's no issue, there's no statements from one of the most influential basketball players to ever play the game, one of the most influential black men to ever um, step foot on this earth. Where was he? You know what I mean? So that's what I look at is like LeBron, like Michael Jordan, he's the best player ever. You know what I mean? Like score, all that, clutch gene, everything. But all around player, I would say LeBron. But as far as like overall impact and what like your body of work and what you do for your community, LeBron, it's not even close. Okay, okay. Uh, who do you cheer for? Who do you root for? Um, I mean, I'm I'm a LeBron fan. Like, I don't I I don't really. Uh, I watch. I like watching the Spurs. I'm a big Popovich fan. Um, mm-hmm. I yeah, I don't watch basketball that much to be real with you. Um, really? I'll watch it. Yeah, I'll watch it when it's on. But as far as like, like yeah, I don't I don't, I don't really watch a lot. Um, oh yeah, I watch NBA like in the playoffs because guys don't play hard till the playoffs hit. And I'll watch yeah. college basketball guys are playing a lot harder but like, i'm not yeah i'm not a big hoop like a sitting down like when i'm coaching guys and stuff i'll watch their film you know what i mean mm-hmm. to help them i watch a lot of film but i don't watch like i don't sit down and watch a lot of basketball games you watch uh the wnba because like that's actual basketball you, mm-hmm. you're, you ever dabble in that yeah 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 no i've uh I've, i i watch a lot i watch them like my my childhood um crush was donna tarazi you guys remember her yeah the point guard she was ice yep. cold Six three point guard at UConn. She was so nasty. Um, she was like my childhood. She was my childhood like hoop crush, and uh, I started watching her. And and when she went to the WNBA and her Sue Bird and all these different women, uh, Maya Moore. Um, yeah, yeah. So like you're saying, like there's there's a ton of fundamentals in women's basketball. So I, I mean, I enjoy watching WNBA when I can. Yeah, that's cool. That's have you seen uh, Harden went to the Nets, bro? Yeah, what's Harden on the Nets look like, bro? Because I thought, man, me also being a, a LeBron James uh, super fan, um, I thought it was trash, bro. Harden, the way he like beefed up this season too, and just look 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 like thicker than a snicker, bro, just to like get himself off the Houston Rockets. And then it was funny because like he was he was like actively looking for a trade but without saying it and then finally they took a fat l to the lakers and he was like yo like i'm not beating lebron this year or i'm not even gonna get close and then john wall was like what the fuck like we're like 16 games in bro and then boogie was like man this shit started like the day you came in overweight so like what what's your take on that like and i know the nba is a business and things have to happen and a lot of people like to point to like lebron when he was like yo fuck this i'm not going to be able to beat the celtics right now without a stacked ass squad so like what what what's the take on harden and even another question is kyrie doing what you you're doing on a bigger scale like when you left basketball and how you your feelings toward it were i'm a fan of kyrie but me too ahead. huge yeah. huge yeah i'm going to grab my charger real quick is that cool yeah, yeah, bro. Yeah. Oh, no, Ray, bro. Honestly, man, I feel like Kyrie's not even as toxic as people say he is. No, man. fuck no, no he's like, not, like bro. he's like Kyrie's just another Indian marching to the beat of his own drum, man. Like that. That's how we are. That's what we <laughs> do. You know what I mean, bro? Like if you guys yeah. want to go to practice because he wants to go to his sister's family, well, why why don't they talk about how important family is to us as like First Nations people, right? So he went to go yeah. celebrate his sister's birthday, but I like saw that. he has such a bad rap of being like a toxic player and everything. But I think he's just really misunderstood. Sure, he says a couple cook things like off the court and whatnot, but like he's not. <laughs> toxic at all he's not no and yeah. people said to hold on let, so someone i was having an argument with my homie yesterday and he was like yo like fuck Kyrie Irving like he's such a weirdo and like like basically just like every everybody else and then he thought i was like trolling him because i was like yo like if Kyrie doesn't want to fucking play like who cares bro like let him go off and do his thing and like let him have his moment because he's gonna decide whether he wants to come back or not it's like the same thing that happened with dennis rodman they were like oh my god dennis rodman missed the finals practice they had him in the gym the next day and he ran circles around everybody you know what i'm saying so it's like why do we put that on athletes to be like, oh man, you got to do this at this time and do that? And Kyrie's just like, like in a great way, a weirdo, you know, like he's weird, he's different, he's he's out there. So like, 
I just want to know one, the James Harden take, and two, what Kyrie's doing right now. Yeah, and you're. I mean, as far yeah, as far as the Nets, man, there's not enough freaking air in the basketball for those two guys. <laughs> <laughs> like, you, 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 know many, you, know many, you know how many times that ball's gonna be dribbled? Like, I, you know those those beat up res balls that have like uh, skin missing and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, I don't know. I, I don't. I mean, I, I uh, Lakers and six. You know what I mean? Like, regardless of Kyrie, like. It's just it's a difficult like when you have two guys because KD doesn't like he can't he doesn't need to dribble much, um, but when you have James Harden and Kyrie who dribble the heck out of the basketball, um, they're gonna make their way out of the East easily. Um, but yeah, I don't think I don't see them being the Lakers. I don't think they're equipped um, enough to beat the Lakers as far as like from a, ste- a team standpoint and structure. But they'll, they're gonna be like they're similar to the Rockets. They're gonna be similar to the Rockets and I mean shoot a lot of threes and. Those guys are going to score a lot of points. Um, with Kyrie, yeah, Kyrie, it's been interesting watching his journey because, I mean, obviously he just discovered his Lakota side uh, two years ago, and he's, you know, he's, he's really diving in that. I'm sure he's doing a lot of work behind closed doors. I'm sure he has, you know, some elders coaching him up and teaching him the ways and um, giving an understanding. So I've enjoyed watching him. He's shining a light, and hopefully he continues to do so on a bigger scale, like you were saying, because, you know, he's, he's from Pine Ridge. His family's from Pine Ridge, and that's 98% poverty rate out there. You know what I mean? So – um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping, you know, that he'll continue to keep obviously advocating, but really utilizing his platform and his resources. But when we talk about, like I said, about the value thing, um, sports, it's like, it's like a slave ownership mentality. You know what I mean? Like we're supposed to play for hurt. We're supposed to play for depressed. We're supposed to play for sad, uh, whatever the case may be is. And, and, and they kind of think they, it's like an ownership thing. You know what I mean? So I think that's a big, that's a big part of it is, is, um, the average fan is, it's funny too, because I'll have people come to me like, Oh, that player sucks. Blah, blah. I'm like, there's not, there's no NBA player that is not good at basketball. Like, I don't, I don't, like you could, you could go to the very end of a, of a 15 man roster. And that guy was an all American. Like, you know what I mean? Like that's the biggest thing. Like I saw when I was climbing, I was like, man, like you guys see like, like Chris Humphreys, 10 year journeyman, you know what I mean? Rebounder defender. You go to open gym with him. He's hitting fadeaway threes. He's hitting, you know what I mean? He's shooting from wherever he wants. Like, it's a, it's a whole, people don't understand. Guys in the league are so dang freaking good. You know what I mean? So the average fan gets upset when they don't ab- like abide by how things are supposed to be. You know what I mean? So everyone gets upset. Like, oh, Kyrie, but like, what, like you said, like, why is, why, why does Kyrie's belief system ha- like upset you so much? You know what I mean? Like, why does like why does his like his thought process piss you off so much? Like that obviously like, you have to look in the mirror and do some internal work if if his actions really upset you that much. So yeah, for the James Harden thing, like um, he could have obviously could have done it a different way. Um, he could have handled it a different way as far as getting out of Houston. But um, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll see. But like I said, Lakers, Lakers and six. Man. Oh, yeah. I, I personally think that's a good weight for Harden though. Like he's like playing bully ball. Like 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 it's not bad way, right? Sure, he's has yeah. a little he has a little, you know, Uncle Rez gut going on. He's a little bad ball. But like he's like he's playing good ball. And like their first game, him and Durant, they dropped 79 together. And he had 14 assists with a triple double. And yeah. like just seeing the pictures of him in Brooklyn. It's like he he looks like he looks happy. It looks like he's willing to put egos aside to make it work with them. And like and like um, I'm just a fan of Kyrie, so like I'm yeah. obviously gonna root for the Nets. So like I really think they're gonna make it yeah, work. Make it. This, this dude. Oh no, without a doubt, bro. <laughs> I, I don't even play basketball. Yeah, for sure. Bad way. <laughs> yeah, bro. Honest to God, Damon, these guys like like chew me up bro like i'm the only lebron fan in our entire <laughs> chat, bro. and they'll be like they'll be like trolling me bro because like like i would say out of all of us i probably watch the most basketball like throughout the year but yeah. that they, they like they're still really knowledgeable but they'll be like yo like well fucking michael jordan didn't have cramps in the game six against the spurs and i'm like bro like, shut up. like shut up. bro that has not you know what i'm saying because he, I mean, I think a lot of it too is like the whole Jordan argument. Um, with Jordan, like, I mean, if you look at like people don't understand, like, do the research. Jordan didn't get out of the first round until he had Scotty. You know what I mean? Like, if Scotty's Scotty, and people don't realize Scotty was nasty when when Jordan was out the league. Scotty was top two in MVP voting. You know what I mean? Like, Scotty is top top three small forward, top five smaller forwards. He's he, you know what I mean to ever do it. Like. So people don't, and then Dennis Rodman, best rebounder ever. Tony Kukoc, one of the best freaking power forwards ever. You know what I mean? Steve Kerr, one of the best shooters ever. He wins those championships because of, because of 
big shots from Steve Kerr and John Paxson before Steve Kerr was there. You know what I mean? So like there is a specific like but people don't do their work. They don't do their research. Oh, six championships, six championships. Like that's always the argument. And you look at LeBron's whole entire body of work, freaking 2007, when he brought that team, that Cavaliers team to the finals. No one even knows any of the guys on that, any of the guys on that team. Uh, Shasha uh, Pavlovich, um, Zajunas Algaskis, Mo Williams. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like that was their squad. He brought them to the finals. You know what I mean? They got four yeah. old, and I remember that, and I was mm-hmm. pretty disappointed. But yeah, I think I think too. Like the the it's already what cemented it for me was the three one like greatest regular season team of all time, like Golden State Warriors firing all cylinders, and then to bring that team back to three one as soon as he blocked that that shit by Iguodala, I was like. Mm-hmm. Don't ever argue with me again. Like yeah. I don't want to hear. I want to hear the noise. And then this fourth championship was like kind of like icing on the cake. But it, it's like a weird. This was the weirdest championship because yeah. it was super like hard for everybody. But it was also like I feel like the Lakers made it look easier, yeah. and there wasn't like that Eastern opposition that I was like, oh shit, like somebody was there to play them. Yeah. The, like Jimmy Butler showed up, but like. Who, you know what I mean? Nobody in 20 years is going to remember how good Jimmy Butler played for like two games, but mm-hmm. I don't know. It was just, it was a weird dynamic, but yeah, like I'm saying, bro, I get constant. I'm glad I finally met someone that has five <laughs> basketball IQ that is like, yo, LeBron James, because River and Denzel and Cole and Warren and my whole, entire friend group never let me hear the end of it. Man. Like, <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember the one time when Raven was like, what is, uh, LeBron have to do to pass surpass MJ, and I was like, he has to surpass Kobe first, bro. <laughs> like Ray got so pissy, bro. It's like a funny and like that's the thing, man. It's like I don't even, I didn't even grow up watching basketball. I didn't start getting into basketball until like two or three years ago, and I started playing 2K on the video game. You know what I mean? And I'm just like, yeah. oh shit, basketball's lit. But like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh man, yeah, for, and and like so what what it comes down to me like i guess why like i declare mj the goat is and like why not lebron it's just like the clutchness that yeah. mj had it's just that that and and that that mentality and that's what kobe got from him was that memba that mamba mentality and that's like he was ice cold you know what i mean like he was like give me the ball I'll do it. I'll do this. I'll do this. And like with with LeBron, it's like he wants to make the right play. Like he wants to make the proper play where he'll kick it out to somebody kind of thing. Opposed to like where like MJ would just be like, I'm ice cold. So that's what it was with me. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, as far as like LeBron's IQ is crazy. Like you guys ever get to Mm -hmm. watch some of his press conferences on the way he's able to break down a whole entire game, literally just sitting there talking to people. It's, I would, I, I would, there's a lot of people I would love to be in a film session with. Like I was fortunate, like I, I was with Brad Stevens, you know what I mean? To be in a film sessions, but I would be so intrigued to sit in a film session with LeBron, you know what I mean? And how mm-hmm. and how he breaks down the game and the levels he does to it. Cause like they always talk about it. Like, there's not too many people out there who have a better IQ ever than, you know what I mean? Than LeBron. Like you said, he he's he has such an IQ, like he's he's focused on making the right play. Even if it, even if people thinks he could, should shoot it or he should, you know, because he's supposed to be the man, you know. Yeah, when yeah. he kicked it to Danny Green, I think that was one like major moment where they were like, "Yo, why didn't like it's game five of the finals? You need yeah. to score." The ball. Bro, but you, it's like you could have laid up it. Yeah, you can take that. You, I would like LeBron James can live with it. I saw something cool too, man. Like one time, DeRozan was talking and he was like, "Yo, we played them." in toronto when i was there and he was like he broke down our play and then told like told damar in the corner that he was in the wrong spot and to go to the other way like who the fuck like no like to memorize your own plays and then remember all their plays and like know which way is cutting like even watching him mic'd up is crazy because he's like he's like just like directing traffic he's just lazy sometimes bro like <laughs> Which yeah, he, saw, he, saw, he, he saw playing legitimate defense a couple of years ago. You know what I mean? Save yeah. his legs. Freaking 37, <laughs> 36. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, I mean, before he was like all, all defensive team like every year. And yeah, probably like four, probably say three or four years ago, he stopped like actually trying on defense. Yeah, yeah. bro. That's crazy. Um, growing up in Alaska, did, did you ever play hockey? You ever skate? You ever get into any of that? Nothing? No, did you no, watch like, any of that at all? 
I'm in I'm in Southeast Alaska, like where I grew up. So like all, we're all it's like uh, our winters are rainy and slushy. You know what I mean? Like we don't yeah. like when you go up north, that's where that, all that stuff is. And I've not, I know folks who who skate on the river or skate on the rivers and skate on the lakes and everything. I went skating like two times in high school, and I think I busted my ass a couple of times. I was like, I'm good on this. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, you must be like the world's like tallest cyclist too, bro. Like people, you ever see like people when you're like cycling, kind of like give you like a weird look, or they're like, "What the fuck?" Because yeah, bro, your I mean, bike that, must be like. Custom. Yeah, I mean that's the cool thing with moving forward. Like kind of like, you know, the like, kind of the segue is that um, I've been really really fortunate. So I'm signing with multiple bike organizations this year as an ambassador. But the cool thing is like these bike organizations have committed bikes around. I have about forty five committed bicycles to my hometown right now. And that's what I'm going to start doing right now to start advocating, connecting the dots, because a lot of these outdoor organizations and bike companies, they're very white, white dominant. And that's what we're seeing now over here, over here in the States is that because of BLM, because of the visibility that's been created, a lot of these white organizations are trying to utilize uh, people of color. And it's happening over there in Canada with First Nations people. You know what I mean? Yeah. So my thing is like, when we talk about like uplifting each other, my thing is like, I, 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 cannot stand the word influencer <laughs> i don't like that word you know what i mean like i don't i don't i don't know what it is just it, it, it's i don't know it's not i don't know it's just kind of superficial to me in a sense um but with me it's like okay like i want i, I enjoy free stuff like i have this cannondale they're giving me a couple of bikes this year and everything but at the same time i'm going to advocate for my community as well like i like free stuff but guess what you're also going to invest in my community somehow so like with the cycling stuff um it's like i said it's a very white space and i've been really fortunate to connect with a lot of bipoc folks on bikes so but yeah to answer your question when i'm out there like you know like, you very rarely see like guys my size <laughs> yeah bro i mean like if you if you see like a white person riding a bike going for a jog you just think they're being active man if you see like a colored person like going for a run you assume he's running from somebody bro if you see like a colored dude on a bike you assume he stole it so like your eyes on man so big ups to you bro for starting to cycle too Absolutely, yeah man. and not it starting it like killing it bro like man the the amount of shit you do like i was just seeing the numbers you're putting up it's like bro that's like that's <laughs> almost like inhumane bro like i i wouldn't enjoy but i guess being a professional athlete too you're probably like yo like i can fucking go farther and farther and farther than anybody else still right do you get competitive in, in biking or what yeah, sometimes, um, like, so there's this group in, in Seattle I ride with, BIPOC, they're uh, called North Star, because, you know, Harriet Tubman, she followed the North Star, um, yeah. but there's a uh, there's this group that I ride with, and they all do a lot of chill rides, and they, like, coordinate it, and there's a night, it's called Don't Get Dropped, where, like, it's a full-on sprint for, like, 17 miles, and guys are freaking cruising, like, 25, 30, 25 miles an hour, <laughs> And uh, you got to kind of keep that pace. And it's been pretty fun because, like, when I went on that 1,400-mile bike ride, like, there was days where we did, like, 113 miles in a day in 95-degree weather. Like, and that's why I talk about the mental side is, like, you want to talk about, like, because I look at the bicycle, it's like, a, it's like a, a good analogy for life, right? So I'm on a, like, and this is why I say this because, like, I, uh, there was one day where we did 7,000 feet of climbing where you're just, like, switch back switch back switch back all the way up just like oh my gosh what am i doing on this bike but it's one of those things just like in life like you're on a big hill in life and you're riding up that hill and either you're going to put your head down and push up that hill and push through adversity you're going to get off your bike and get picked up like in life you want someone to come and pick it pick you up and do it for you or you're going to go walk your bike and ride down the hill back to the bottom of the hill because that's the easiest thing to do. You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's just like life. It's either you're going to go down to the bottom of the hill before where you started, you're going to push to the adversity, or you're going to get off the bike and walk it. You know what I mean? It's like, that's kind of like the best way to break it down. Like, man, the 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 mental um, the mental benefits it's had for me has been, it's crazy. There's a lot of studies too. There's an organization I'm working with right now. Um, they're dropping a lot of different studies and statistics for kids and how like their their mental health improves from cycling and what it's done for a lot of people. So I hear it all the time. There's a lot of people who um, get into cycling and there's like, man, it just completely changes your mental. So like right now with cycling, that's what I'm doing with cycling right now is I'm trying to break down um, barriers. I'm trying to open doors um, for the communities I work with because that's what it's all about. You know, at the end of the day, is like we could all go as far as we possibly can. But, you know, if we're not bringing folks with us, 
if we're not reaching back and, and, and seeing how we can help others behind us and, and, and taking people with us or supporting those who, you know, who have supported us, then it doesn't mean anything. You know what I mean? Because the capitalistic mindset and the colonized mindset is me, 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 I, I, I. If I, if I'm not getting it, then nobody gets it, you know? And that's my, my thing is like, I, I like this stuff and I know that um, they're supporting me because of my passion and what I want to do and my storytelling. But at the same time, we don't want charity. We want investments. You know what I mean? That's investments in education. That's investments in our mental health resources. That's investment in um, our community programming. You know what I mean? Like the whole one-off charity crap, it's not going to work. You know what I mean? That's just trying to check a box. So that's what I'm doing right now is I'm holding these folks accountable. Gang. Bro. Bro. You are the man, Damon. Shit's <laughs> it. man, it's great to like connect with you and yeah, just be able that. to like, I was watching your shit, bro. And I was like, all right, man, like there's obviously some here, you know, like people, some people probably just see you as like a basketball player, you know, but it's like, bro, like you said, man, I think that's a perfect thing. You know, if all I ever am is a basketball player, then, then I failed, you know? So to, to be able to touch so many things and just keep evolving and keep moving and keep you know, reaching back, man, because people get into positions like yours and they're not willing to, you know, pull the person back, man. So I can't thank you enough. Um, but man, we're getting a little bit, a little bit crunched yeah. for time. So what we'd like to do is how we usually end this is we'd like, uh, to put you up on the main board, bro. Just, uh, say, say whatever you need to say, bro, to whoever you need to say it. We'll, uh, we'll fall back for a minute and then, uh, we'll say our goodbyes after that, but we'll put you up here on the main screen though. Mm -hmm. No, yeah, yeah. I just want you know, I, I really appreciate you guys bringing me on. I appreciate everybody tuning in. And I guess that's one of the biggest things I would get, I would want people to get from this is that you don't necessarily have to be in a box. You don't necessarily have to be what society has um, deemed you as or has uh, made it made you think that you need to be. Uh, I think it's very important to continue to evolve. And if you heard my story, you know, I grew up in this small community and I've been very, very fortunate. So I, that's what I would want people to get from this or gain from this is that you could always um, evolve. You could always continue to grow. You could always continue to um, pursue your, pursue your passions. It's never too late. And that's what I've done. So again, no, I'm, I'm thankful. I appreciate it. Um, I'm, I'm accessible via email. You know, like I said, if there's men watching or interested in the curriculum that I've built, um, reach out. So that's what, like I said, that's what it's all about. Hey, bro. Once again, thank you so much, Damon. Man, we'd love to have you on again. We'll be sending you that sweater off as soon as we get Absolutely. some merch. Just, just as a thank you, bro. And man, keep doing what you're doing. Keep advocating. Keep, keep grinding. Keep taking those next steps, man. Because you got people like me and River that that are that are looking up to you. You know, man. Yeah, and like, I'm just so that. proud to know you and and to follow your journey and and get to know you as a person. Now it's like, man, I can I, I can see something ahead of me. You know, like somebody's blazing a path ahead of me. And I'm like, man, that's that's where I need to follow. And that's yeah. what you're doing for me. Brother. Yeah. So thank you so much. I'll let River kind of jump into. Thank yeah, you guys. bro. I mean, you stole my words, man, right out of my mouth. No, man, I, I, I just want to say thanks, bro, for coming on, for giving us the time to hear your stories, for um, educating not only us, but our listeners and viewers as well, man. It, it means so much. And um, don't ever be... Don't be afraid to reach out if you ever want yeah. us to uh, help share anything, if you ever want to elevate anything, if you want to get a voice out for a certain project. we'll Without a doubt, we'll be happy to work with you, man. Anything, if you ever want to jump on again, for sure. Especially when we move to, uh, when, when me and Ray move to BC and we get our own little studio going, man. Once this pandemic sub subsides, you'll be further along in your journey. You could come kick it with us in in the actual studio face-to-face -face conversation bro it'll be a good time but i just want to say thanks again man it means so much yeah and we're gonna hire you for a wrist tourney too bro so you gotta come come that was in the room bro all right bro much love we're gonna let you go appreciate you guys appreciate you guys man Hey, that was dope, bro. That that that's the man right there, dude. That guy was so so cool. Just cool, you know. Like, man, there's there's dudes out there that are doing it that big. It's like, it's cool to have somebody, like I said, in front of us that we're like, I look up to that guy. You know, I want to be like that guy. I want to do what he's doing, man. So it's dope, bro. We got some money to give away, but I think we should do it on Instagram, bro. We're kind of we don't we never like hook up our Instagram followers, so it might be good to like let them jump in. What do you think? Sure, bro. Why yeah. Not? 
All right, so everyone, go over to our Instagram, man. We're gonna we're gonna do a give our giveaway for the two hundred dollars over there. Uh, see what they got to say for a little bit. Um, in the meantime, man, um, what do we got going on, bro? I'm, I'm uh, to- the podcast studio is under construction. That's why I've been in my room the past couple things, but it'll be ready to go next week, bro. The studio will be back. The only thing it's missing is you. Hopefully uh, you'll be back too, bro. Yeah, bro. I think I think we got to build it over here, bro. Look, I even got the background already. So it, it's over here, man. Much love again for everybody that, that stayed tuned in, man. Our guest next Sunday is going to be none other than Indian Car. Uh, what the hell? Native Americana, bro. The GOAT, the indigenous rock star himself, bro. My Keith Sec- is dusty. My plates are expired. expired. Let's go. Keith Please, Mr. Go. Officer. Let me explain. Yeah, we got Keys to Cola coming through next Sunday, man. We're so excited. He's going to make it to a podcast. <laughs> <in> my- <laughs> He's going to be telling us a story, bro. We're so excited. Uh, in the meantime, too, yeah, we're going to get some more merch rolling out. And if you haven't received your merch yet, we're really sorry. We got caught up with Canada Post. Hopefully, it gets to you in the next couple of days, man. Enter our giveaway, the Wells Crew shoes. Those are, those are going to be some dope shoes. I wish I could enter myself, but... Obviously, that'd be cheap, man. And, bro, I don't know. What else you got going on? Bro, I've been doing my dad's show lately. So, like, my dad's my dad has, like, a morning podcast now, right? Like, every yeah. Sunday. And, uh, man, just watching him do his thing and going out there, bro, it's, like, it's like warming my heart, bro. I got to get up at, like, 8 a.m. every day, get his, like, track music ready, get everything together. But uh, just to be able to, like, do that and see, see him and – I don't know, man. It, it just feels it feels cool, man. This this podcasting stuff, this everything is just where it needs to be, you know. And I'm I'm really grateful for it, and I'm really excited that we're doing this together, bro. We're gonna keep killing it. Thank you for everyone that tuned in, man. I'm gonna let you go, River. You got anything? Uh no, nah, man. I'm I'm content with everything, bro. Um, just keep doing what we're doing, man. Um, yeah. keep. Just keep doing it. Yeah, man. That's about it. I have some homework to do, though, bro. Hey, yeah. Let's go give away this money, and then we'll uh, we'll, we'll let you get to your homework. Join us on Instagram. Much love to everybody. Peace. Peace.